Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 259. With me is uh, two cohorts in crime, <laughs> Mrs. Bob Goodman, um, currently with the library collection, but yet to be other things in the world of, which we'll probably talk to as time goes on, and Mr. Dean Schmidt, who is the founding father of MetaSearch. Wait, 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 what are the two? What are the two terms? MetaSearch. We have uh, BasecampMeta.com and soon to be released MetaSearchMarketing.com. So all things Meta. And Robert, uh, Robert uh, delivered to this week. I was worried that Robert was going to get a little too busy for us today uh, and not get us our list in time. But Robert, uh, Mr. Robert Cole with Rock Cheetah, who has been unfortunately absent from our dialogue for these past few months because uh, JD Powers and uh, Focus Right has. Uh, cornered his attention and time the entire uh, months going over doing data, um, produces us our list, which he uh, curates every week for free. Anybody that would like to sign up for it, uh, for, uh, they can go to bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash rock cheetah, all lowercase. And uh, he does his weekly. Oh, hey, Tristan, how are you, sir? Very good. Thank you very much, much, Mr. Gray. How are you? I am doing well. You're well dressed and groomed and what the heck? What, what, what? I, I finally relented and got rid of the COVID haircut or the COVID one <laughs> growth, whatever it was, whatever you want to call it. And I went to I went to the barbers and I thought I'd put a shirt on just for you, Lauren. That, you know, wait a minute. Uh, here's the magic question. Did you bathe this month? Th this month? Oh, don't, don't be silly. No, <laughs> no. That's not that's not till Q3. You know, oh, oh, okay. I just... <laughs> You know, I was just going for the jackpot there. That everything got taken care of at once. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's not enough talcum powder in the world. Uh. <laughs> um, so uh, I was just talking about Robert Cole's list, the uh, getting people to sign up for it and so forth. He had some really fun topics to this. Of course, he was pushing his focus right review for the cleanliness issue, which uh, we can definitely hit as a strong topic for today. Mr. Ben! Morning Hi. team. The consistency of the dress code from the across the pond today. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we 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 don't ever really coordinate. Uh, and if you look, one of us is yin, one of us is yang. You work out which one it is. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I'm going for the Malfoy look, the Draco Malfoy. You know, how Slytherin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh hopefully you won't be slithering into anything on this show laura let's, uh, no, keep, it, no, let's keep it pg-13 yeah i'm still going wait i'm still i'm going for the ponytail look which i'm just about there pretty soon it's going to be back to the ponytail living my, living my teen years all over again <laughs> now, now, are you going man bun style or mullet style oh yeah, man bun. Oh, yeah it's, it's, oh, it's yeah. a business in the front party in the back no it's uh yeah. it'll go ponytail I, I, no 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 man bun that's that's against the law that people get shot for that Please, um, Lauren. Please. No, no. <laughs> I would no, love to pony. see you. Oh, ponytail. Ponytail. I will make a significant donation to a charity of your choice <laughs> if you come on to the next call with a man bun, looking oh, like no. a, looking like an American even, pineapple. No. <laughs> Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Yeah, but you have you have to make sure the sides are totally shaved in, and you know, and the, and the man bun on the top, and the really long beard. You know, that's that's the way yeah. to go, buddy. Yeah, no, decades of hospitality have got to say, Lauren, that, lost that would be bad. Would I, be I'm bad. not the same as you, Lauren. I could not, I could not get the long hair. I mean, partially because of the baldness at the back here, which is hidden very nicely. But partially, partially. all right, all right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but what I was able to do prior to uh, my visit to the barbers is that I could actually put a bubble in my beard. It was getting Ooh. that long. Yes, oh. my my uh, my two young children found that highly hilarious. That, uh, that that was the case, but sadly that has gone. Oh, oh and Dean went chewing. dark and Stuart popped up. What'd you do to Dean, Stuart? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what is up? What's your yeah, hat I... say? Hold on, what, lean down, lean down. Oh, it's a it's a Southern Tide hat. And in following up on your self um, cutting thing, the reason I'm wearing a hat is because I started buzzing my hair this morning, and my rate my um, shaver ran out rechargeable but for some reason it won't run while it's charging so so i've got a half cut head it's, it's interesting. oh that's amazing i've had that a rough 2020 buddy you could really make my year by taking that half yeah it's <laughs> not gonna happen you could really <laughs> i don't see the incentive for me on that one you know just, that just seems like a one joy. Joy. Just the smile joy. the smile on little ben's face when he yeah. sees that's that should be Joy enough for you there, Stewie. Come on, Unky Stew. Come on, Unky Stew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I have not given up on you not wearing, that. <laughs> wearing that, that T-shirt yeah. that you shouldn't be allowed to wear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, with that in mind, uh, with the list that Mr. Robert did give us, and there's actually some other lists of stuff. Hey, Lily, how are you? Thank God. Thank, Thank God. Goodness. Somebody's bringing an organization to our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we spent the last, minute, last and, 10 minutes talking about haircuts. So, you, you know, yes, I really. know. I've been, been off track before I've you even started. in the background for a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Let the children have their play, and then in, in you come. Sort the order. I like <laughs> it. Exactly. Three times over. If we want to tackle Mr. Roberts' first major article, I would like to stand on a soapbox briefly and talk about the fact that this is a, a, a passe conversation that should have been resolved weeks ago by hoteliers. And instead, we're still talking about it now, and which is the focus on cleanliness and the safety and security of their guests. And only now are places like Marriott and HLA saying, gee, we should enforce this with our guests. <laughs> yeah. That would be so, good. Here's my soapbox yeah, start yeah. to the conversation. I'm going to put the link in, and then if you guys want to add to that uh, that particular yeah. comment, you're more than welcome to, I would say. I mean, credit I mean, where credit's due, right? AHLA have come out as the first major organization to really start pushing this. But you're right. It should have happened months ago, literally months ago. There, there were task forces across the, the globe. We, I was a part of one here in, the, in South Carolina called Accelerate Model Beach, and we had guidelines that we pushed out to members back in probably mid, mid to late April, you know? So why the big organizations didn't take a stand on this, especially the face mask stuff, I, I don't understand. Um, but hey, it's happening now, so we need to get behind it. Like I've been saying for weeks and weeks, we need to change the narrative in the media and, and start saying responsible travel is safe. If we don't start saying that, we're gonna lose the year completely. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's an interesting time to mention responsible travel. Um, today in the UK, it became mandatory to wear face masks inside shops, uh, inside um, uh, inside cafes that you you dine in, but not those in which you go in to then eat outside at. Uh, it's crystal clear this legislation. It's crystal clear. <laughs> but from my, from my trip into into the city today, despite it being mandatory to wear masks and I mean, it's just, it's a more diluted version of travelling sensibly, even if you're just travelling into town. There was maybe a 60% take-up rate. And the hey, police have already come out and said, there's no way we can enforce this. You can't chase people around waving surgical masks at them to get them to do this. So it really is, the onus is on, I don't know, joint collective shaming of people who don't do this, ostracising mm -hmm. of, if you're not wearing a mask, you're a danger to me. You're not travelling sensibly and you are holding back the recovery of the industry. But there has been a lot of criticism about it as well. Not so much in terms of people not wanting to do it, more in the fact that the um, uh, you know the pub public is incredulous at the fact that it's taken so long. And, and it has been likened, you know, the, the face mask coming on, uh, you know, so late in the day, in, you know, in this whole thing, it's been likened to um, trying to wear a condom at a baby shower. You know, it really <laughs> is that way. Uh, which I enjoyed very much, um, uh, that analogy. <laughs> and it's so true. It did really you go to so true. Well, no, you you enjoyed going to the baby shower, Tris, or what? <laughs> yeah. But we have to start where we are. Indeed. And we have to stop Indeed. it now. Indeed. Because this can go on and on forever, or yeah. we can, you know, all agree to be tough, disciplined, united, smart, and loving, and wear our masks. And, and uh, you know, we really need leadership to reach into the souls of the public and make them feel how important it is to identify yourself as someone who cares enough about your fellow man to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. But, but, but Adele, uh, Adele for president. <laughs> Adele for president. I'd put you up against Kanye, honestly. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree. Well, as I keep saying, if only Andrew Cuomo were president right now, it would be it would be better. So just listen to him. Just listen to him. I, I do worry if if we do finally get over this COVID hurdle, and I, and, and I believe we will. I, I genuinely believe there's there's enough sensible people out there to outweigh the uh, less sensible people, shall we shall we call them? Um, but I do worry about our small group and what we're going to talk about in the future. <laughs> Because it's been all <laughs> consuming for so many months. To actually talk about another topic that is as important is not going to feel as important. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it does feel like HDM's been hospitality digital mourners for, like, <laughs> for the last eight weeks. Um, <laughs> beating the views, beating the views. Oh, Actually, I have another. I have another soapbox we can stand on. I mean, if you want to, that we can we can merge our we can merge our show into a higher level. And I another think thing, our industry is stuck in 101 in first gear. There is a repetitive white noise dialogue about fun. Everybody's got a hammer to fix a computer. Nobody has the proper tools and proper skills for advanced dialogue. They're still talking about fundamental marketing things that are defunct, out of date, out of place, and not functionally rational at this point. Nobody's having advanced conversations on what you really need to be doing in a very granular way. They're still basically echoing each other. It's like an echo chamber. Everybody's walking around trying to offer solutions are still talking about the same thing, to your point. I mean, I mean, and seriously, from our show, it's like, yes, I mean, we're constantly trying to, every week is different as to what COVID's impact is. Mm -hmm. We restart, we false start, we, you know, reopening, pre-opening, not opening, closing for, you know, whatever. But nobody's talking about advanced ways of doing this stuff. Who's going to merge out of this is going to be some lean, mean fighting machines. Those are the ones that are going to survive out of this stuff. Not the people yeah, that are going, what's PP saying, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know I, I why? It's simple. because we like the easy way out. We want to talk about the simple stuff. Like there yeah. is, there is too much effort required. Too much of you know. We talk about this in other industries all the time, creating what we call spaciousness, walking away from the craziness, and taking a moment to think with a clear head and actually move things forward. And I think that as a hospitality industry in general, we don't necessarily do a great job of that. Maybe par partially because it's a 24 seven industry, right? So there's, there's not much that we can do about that. But through proper planning, you can take time to really set aside because I think it just feels overwhelming to do next level tactics. And so people kind of keep saying like, oh, I don't have time, even though they could create the time because it just sounds like something impossible for them to tackle. In fact, people, people say, I don't have the time to do important work because I'm lost in a flurry of day-to-day, -day, right. you know, chaos. And the fact is, is that you focus on the important work, your chaos will diminish and you will be free from doing the same repetitive thing over and over again. It's like being a mouse or a hamster on a wheel. You're just always chasing new business to replace the business that you lost because you can't move forward with holding and loyal the customers you have and just growing your business naturally for example or wasting the time you know uh with irate guests in, instead of solving the root cause of the problem to have less irate guests. right well, you're absolutely right. And we can look throughout the history of the travel industry. This is not a new thing. Let's, let's take an example of rate parity, for example. Rate parity has been around for 20 years that we've had problems with this. It used to be that, uh, you know, book direct versus a, an OTA or whatever, and we had channel managers out there, uh, Easy Yield, that uh, was one of the channel managers trying to keep those rates all the same. We had that challenge back in 2002. And we're still dealing with it today. The difference is it has evolved. Just as soon as you figure out, okay, here's how I'm going to fix that problem, it evolves and changes. Today we have the problem of wholesalers. Uh, we can pick on a momo.com because they no longer exist. So, right, so they were coming in. We were giving them rates we shouldn't have, and they were coming in and undercutting us all over the place. It keeps on changing. It's a little bit of a whack-a-mole game, but the problem is still the same. But I think it goes wider than just the, the hotels and the hoteliers here. Yeah, sure. you know, the day-to-day the -day thing that you're talking about there, you know, everyone that 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 i can understand that with the 24 7 hospitality industry but the hospitality industry uh, uh, need to uh, what well, they are they're always looking towards their partners for help you know technology companies service providers whatever it may be and to, to lauren's point i think there's uh, people fall into to, to two camps here there are the people that one actually don't know what they're doing which is why they're still pushing the same old stuff because their business model is probably the same as the uh, you know the 24 7 rat race that's going on within the hospitality model you know losing clients out the back door and trying to shove new ones in the front door constantly happening we know that was with mm -hmm. several 
several providers. And the second one is, and this is my tinfoil hat talking here, I think there are uh, uh, companies out there that do know what to, to do in this. They're just keeping it quiet, not shouting about it and charging customers a, 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 a tidy sum during a difficult period. I mean, I for one would like to see more technology providers coming out and offering things to help, even if it's free. Hmm. Mm. Free. Tracy. Watch this space. Is all I'm going to say. Watch this space. Free, Tris. Are you hinting yeah. at something there? Tris? I may well. Do. I may <laughs> not, but watch this space. There you go. Hmm. Hmm. Once again, shameless plugs. Live. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I you know, this is fresh in my never mind. used to have been... shameless plugs back in the day. I feel like Lily, you, you've sent us down this path. I've started the trend. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, there was never there was never a weekly survey that came out. You know, no, was there wasn't. Was no. <laughs> Uh, listen, guys, you're never going to believe what the field travel insights hey, says. Hey, boys, when in Rome, when in Rome. <laughs> when in Rome yeah. And if anybody needs keyless entry, you know who to call. <laughs> well, I mean, some of the other things that Robert I love did you, today, I love you. There, there's some stuff that he pointed out about how there is going to be a change in ownerships. There's going to be, you know, the, the weak will fail, the strong will survive, but the margins are going to be less. Uh, tax is going to be different. Uh, asset values can invert, and which is going to create a sell-off. There's lots of, I mean, there's articles he th peppered through all the different categories related to these kind of things. But to your point, Tris, is that there is there is solution processes. And the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm up about this is that I just, with some new clients I've just got onto, they're all excited about the call. We get on the call, and it felt like I went back a year. Okay, we're taking this off the shelf from... What's, what are we going to do for our paid campaign? And it's like you realize the verbiage and everything and the strategy and the targeting, all is different now. There's nothing about what you're talking about in the terms that you're talking about it that are relevant to what you need to be considering right now. You're, you're thinking that you're turning the lights on and putting coal back into the furnace and firing it up and, you know, turning the sign on and people are going to go stand back out in the station that they were standing out before and we're getting back to business. None of that's true in any market. I mean, and the worst part of it was that this was one of the cities that was flaring up at this point. They're trying to get back into the business game and literally the city is blowing up and make national news. And it's like, uh, guys, if you yeah. look out the door, who's going to want to come and stay with you when everybody's telling you that city is going crazy with, with, the, with the growth of the, of the, of the pandemic? And why do you think that is, Lauren? Do you think they've been given bad advice? Do you think they're previous agencies? Or do you think they've just buried their head in the sand? Do I don't think, think that they learned what they thought they knew back then, and then they're just bringing in the old information again. And then I think because they've been out of it, literally out of it, and they're coming back in the door, they're thinking, oh, well, this is what I know. This is what we do. This gets back to it. And, and it's like – Yeah, and, uh, and keep in mind, too, a lot, a lot of hotels don't have agencies. So I know, I know you guys are on the bandwagon of uh, bashing agencies, which we all do on the show, right? I think that there's a lot of dishonesty <laughs> out there, but – but I think I think it's it's bigger than that. I think a lot of folks just don't know where to turn, you know. And, and the, thought, the thought exercise we've been telling people to really push this point home is: imagine if you jumped in a rocket ship today and you were going to open a new hotel on a new planet with new people that you're targeting in a new destination that you don't know. That's the mindset you have to take. How would you approach that job differently? Because your consumers completely fundamentally changed. Their motivators are different. Their fears are different. Their, their financial position, the demographics you're going to reach, everything is different. You, you've got a completely foreign audience now, and the destination and the product you have is viewed completely differently than it was 12 months ago. The so thing nothing is, you be did before will work anymore. The only yeah. thing that would be the same with that, though, Stuart, on a different planet is that we'd still need face masks, but for oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I have Same's a different, uh, I have a different, you know, thought uh, mindset test. What if your um, uncle died and left you a hotel and you know you're starting from from nothing you've got a bill to pay and it's all on you and you've got to make it work where are you going to find business what do yep. you need to do to make every single penny go as far as it possibly can and bring the most results and uh and i think that if more people uh got out of their silo mindset and onto an entrepreneurial mindset um the the ideas 
and the thinking would would flow much more easily. Mm. I'll add to that contribution one thing, and that is, is that we going into this had a it's not my problem, it's somebody else's or I did what I could do. We I've often mentioned that there's two types of people. There's the people who tell you 100 things that they tried to do that didn't do it. And then there's the other people that just got it done when you asked them to get it done. And if you want to know about the 102 things that they tried to get there, they'll tell you if you want to know. But they just got done when you asked them to get done. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these people went back to their jobs with that mindset of doing what they thought they could do. Hey, I, I can't sell 50 cent pieces for, you know, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar piece for 50 cents on the side of the street right now. Nobody's buying. Well, mm -hmm. That's not an answer. You're, you're not generating revenue. What can you sell? There's hotels that are selling to these school pods now, little meeting spaces so that kids that are being put together in small groups have a common space to go to. They're, they're doing, uh, in Europe, there was a news feed about the fact that they're doing uh, uh, hotel concerts where you go to the hotel and you're on your own balcony and you're looking at a concert. And the concert's being presented to the hotel because the building was designed that. That's answers. That's not what you used to do. That's not anything you ever thought about doing, but it's the way things are now. You know, does it last right. forever? No, do, but you need to make payroll now. You know, do they have people on the do they have people on the balcony on top pouring beer on you so you get the authentic feel of being in a well, there's some there there is definitely some kegeration things going on, but that's just <laughs> another story. <laughs> You can't say that, Tris. You live in the poshest part of England. So, you know how the bathroom is, and if you have beer with you, how easy it is to get another drink. Just, I mean, to me, it seems like an easy thing. But it's, I mean, it's called the loo. The loo, Lauren. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> just a point, Stuart. There, um, so, sorry, Dean. I'll. I just want to address a point there from Stuart. I don't want anything I come say to come across as agency bashing. Lord knows, I love a good agency. What I think when I when I talk about agencies giving them the bad advice i don't mean malicious advice i mean a lot of people who work for agencies probably haven't been through something like this before they've not been they've they've had the good times you know they made hair whilst the sun shone unfortunately the sun has now exploded and there is no hair anymore there's just like a post-apocalyptic wasteland so i i don't mean to bash on the agencies and it, it's a difficult situation they're in because there's no playbook for this um, yeah, the, and they're, no, not built, they're not built to pivot quickly either. A lot of the bigger agencies especially, they're not, you know, they, they're built to scale and modularize what they offer. You know, you look at, and, and I could, I'm not going to name them, but you know who they are. You know, they have a, here's the packaged offering for a flat fee, and it's, it's about how efficiently can I produce this to maintain profitability. So yeah. I think that, that kind of approach, if you're, if you're with that, that kind of agency, you're going to struggle because they're not going to yeah. innovate. They're not. And Lauren, to the point you made as well about it, it, hotels coming out and saying, oh, we, you know, we're going to try the tactics we 12, tried 12 months ago. I don't think anybody can say that the leadership within the hospitality industry hasn't been screaming and shouting from the top of soapboxes and vacant hotels that this isn't going to work. Nobody can say there hasn't been a flurry of information coming. Now, whether or not they've listened to it or been exposed to it is a different matter. But I don't think anybody can point fingers at the, at the industry and say, you guys never told us this was going to happen. You, you know, well, and, and to that exact yeah. point, you know, when we get into territory like this, what we in, instinctively try to do is look at what does my historical data tell me? What, what worked before, what didn't work before? That's our every instinct in our body says, go to the data and look at it. Well, guess what? <laughs> the data sucks right now. Yeah. And all that data, none of, it, none of it's right. So, but that doesn't mean the data is not important. What it means is you've got to start getting new data. You've got to start running these types of digital campaigns and see what the hell is going on out there. What is working, what's not working, and start putting together new plans based on that. And therein lies the problem, though, as well, because it's like, you know, the full circle. You know, the, the hotels don't have the marketing budget to be able to go and do this and actually right. test as, as much as they want. So I, I understand the difficulty that is going on there. But I, I just wanted to um, bring up a point of Richard's mention back to the hotel cleanliness in the, in the chat. And he said he stayed at two major hotel brands over the past 14 days. And he's getting uh, a lot of uh, frustration from the lack of follow through with their cleanliness policy. And he's talking about a sanitizer and cleaning public spaces. Um, I, I, I want to share a, a very brief, and you'll find the pun in that very shortly, story of my exploits. I managed to leave 
my house with my family and I went to um, a, a larger city nearby um, it's very well known um, it's um, they've just won the uh, the Premier League so Stuart you'll know that um, <laughs> so it's uh, so it's it's Liverpool over here in the UK and I stayed in, uh, yeah indeed I didn't want to say it but there you go um, but they, um, I, I, I support the same as you, Stu. I, I'm with you. So it was tear. There's a tear running. It was painful for me. <laughs> painful for me to just go to this city, let alone stay mm -hmm. there. So staying in the hotel, a beautiful hotel, very very nice. Um, you know, very hipster, huge rooms, great. However, very shocked the next morning when I get to go into the uh, into the little shower room that it's got, single door into a shower cubicle open the door, turn around and put my towel on the hook. What do I find there? But a pair of men's underwear. Now, they were not mine. Now, one of two things... All his wife's. Yes, yeah, all my wife's. <laughs> one of two things has happened here. My wife has snuck off without me knowing. And there we go. We'll leave that there. And and, and I'm pretty certain that wasn't the case because I was with her all night. It was on the hook, Chris? On the hook. Or... And so when I uh, when I complained in the morning, and it wasn't much of a complaint as a seriously guys, you know this is not a small faux pas. This is oh my god, even pre COVID, even pre COVID, this isn't small, you know. Yeah. Um, and apparently, not only do they have um, cleaner that goes in who should check it, they also have another person who's meant to come in and check the cleaner's work and the double policy. So it, 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 it's clear hotels, as the rope note, are still struggling. To, to get around this and the problem you've got is all it takes is one case and you're screwed that's yeah. it because that gets out because i've gone and, and told that story several times i'm not going to name the hotel because it's not fair uh, and, and i don't want to do that besides i don't think there's going to be too many people wanting to stay in liverpool at the moment uh who are listening <laughs> to this show but uh, but still sure it does Stuart yeah, loves Stuart. It. <laughs> yeah i'm gonna go celebrate the championship yeah but i i can i can feel richard's pain as he talks hey at least you've got a free pair of underwear <laughs> <laughs> and what that what happened at that one hotel if it was a brand or if it belonged to a collection then yeah. it not only diminishes their reputation forever but the whole process. yeah uh, they, you have to wonder like, how are they enforcing mm -hmm. you know the brands are putting out oh we're all doing this and this and that but expecting it to turn on a dime with very little enforcement, my guess is that their inspectors probably aren't traveling right now either. Mm. And so it's kind of a honor system. Mm. Um, and just like any other brand issue, you're going to have some that are doing it well and some that are not doing it well. And I think that that's a real threat to the brands right now because they've made such a big deal about it. They've taken such a, a significant stand on these issues. And then if you go and you visit, you know, you've had one bad experience. If you go to another hotel within the same brand and have another bad experience and God mm. forbid a third bad experience, that's pretty much it. And then you assume that the brand is no longer. Well, to be really pragmatic about the logistics of this, you have an exceptionally exhausted team that may have stayed in existence through this entire process. They are first that they dumped on, they got dumped on five extra jobs when everybody else got furloughed. They existed under the sheer threat of, you know, you could be next, do whatever you have to do. It doesn't matter about title. If you got to clean a toilet, clean a toilet. And if you got to run the front desk, run the front desk. And they are, they were running this marathon this entire time. Now, perhaps the hotel has decided to think they're restarting or pre-opening or whatever it is that they're in the process of trying to do. They bring in a crew that has been on ice, metaphorically, for a few months now that have not been brought up to speed as to what needs to get done, how it needs to get done or whatever needs to get done. And they get brought into a team that has no time for them. They're like, thank God, just watch the front desk so I can go to sleep. Whatever it is, you got two bad mixes of motivation at this point. And then you try to open the door saying, we're gonna do everything that we're supposed to do and this and this and this. And then you get bad underwear in the shower and you know, to Stuart's point, you get an extra pair to bring home, but you know. Um, but the idea of it is, is that there's been no uplifting. There's been no culture to Adele's value proposition there has been no less rally let's this is the end of the marathon let's sprint let's get to the finish line let's get back coordinated to what we're doing this is what we've learned while we've been running the fort let's teach you the people that have been on ice people on ice infuse us with some energy let us get back up to speed that this is worth all the pain that we've been going through 
it may not be happening in all these hotels. They ne- they might just be trying to go through a lot of this. And and as we pointed out before, a lot of them aren't up to speed with the reality of what their day to day is in the new way of things being handled. Yeah. And I was going to argue with you and then argue with myself. Okay. I was going to argue with him and then argue with myself. So uh, the, the, I, I think the part of the problem, Lauren, is you say it's the final sprint of a marathon, but the, the end isn't in sight for a lot of people. No. In, in, in hope, there isn't a lot of hope. There was hope coming, you know, three or four weeks ago, and then we saw this massive resurgence in – I think it's ripped the rug from under everyone. And there's this sense of everyone I talk to of just like, I don't think I can do this for much longer. Right. So, so I think we're dealing with that. I don't, I, you know, so it's, it's easy to say we need a rally, but, but it's, it's really difficult. And that's where I'll argue with myself because I feel like, although it's difficult, we've got to do better. We've got to expect better. Something like that is inexcusable in hospitality, especially now, you know, it, it's not like it was, Bought up and, and hidden somewhere in a nook that someone wouldn't le- look at, right? For maybe if they're doing a quick inspection. But hanging up on the back of a bathroom door is a common place that people leave stuff. It's a fundamental check in every housekeeping playbook I've ever seen, right? So you've got to you've got to hold yourself to higher standards, and and we we as consumers and as hospitality professionals should expect and demand better than that. I think the housekeeper should could have been rushed. And uh, sometimes, you know, when you're rushing, you don't look up. You know, there's a million reasons right. it could have happened, but it doesn't mean it should have happened, right? right. I, I'm Absolutely, not, I'm, I'm not. I'm not unsympathetic to it. Not unsympathetic to it. Simply because I knew that they were um, uh, quite high occupancy. I mean, obviously, I didn't ask them, but I can see the and place. Probably short staffed, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, right. that, that was definitely yeah. because the the young the young lady that I spoke to in the in the morning, who was the duty manager, who came on, and I said, "Look, listen." You know, this is what I found. She looked stressed before I even dropped that on her toes. And then she just went white. It was mm. like, oh, you know. It, Wait, did you literally drop it on her toes? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, the okay. problem was dropped on her toes. Yeah. I was watching yeah. another scouse's pair of underpants. It wasn't that yeah. Yeah, the reality is, is that there is human error because all yeah. of the staff members are people. And 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 we 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 make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, but the process is yeah. there to double check on mm-hmm. the person's mistakes. Yeah. So There's the difference between a mistake and not following process, and and this right. is this is an example of someone not going through a checklist. Exactly. You know, and that that's something we have to hold to the highest standard in hospitality. Because if if we start cutting corners on the basic fundamentals of process we're not going to recover nearly as quickly. And this is going to be a lot more painful than it needs to be. I'll, I'll ask Ed, I wish, I wish Ed, Ed was here because I'd actually argue with him on a statement he used to make in the show months ago, a year ago maybe even, that our industry needed the infusion of outside resources to give us better perspective on what we should be doing. And I would contend that right now, as what you mentioned, Stuart, there is no end in sight. But what people love about the love of this industry is the satisfaction the industry gives us. When I say a sprint, and meaning that we can collaborate and create a culture and create motivation between ourselves. It's to mm-hmm. bring life back into the purpose of what we're doing. Not that there's an end to the process, but a resurgence of why we're doing this. That's why we're losing some people out of the industry right now. And some of the people that didn't deserve to be in the industry aren't staying in the industry because they got brought in because of their technical expertise or their marketing expertise or their operational expertise, but they weren't hoteliers. They weren't hospitality spirit, uh, heart of the servant people. And that's the core of the people that need to bring back our our destroyed industry. I mean, our industry is destroyed right now. It has been purposely dismantled. And we keep trying to do these things that we keep trying to do, but we're, we're fighting an unknown emphasis. You know, a city flares up or now a market that we're try, trying to get people to come travel from, we don't want them because they're coming from a high, high risk area. It's constantly shifting every day as to what we're doing. But the idea of it is, to what Driss point out, the fundamentals have to be there. And that comes from the fact that somebody truly thrives on what they do in satisfaction of a guest. Well, and I guess satisfaction is going to be more important than ever because it leads to the user-generated content, the reviews, which Adele, I'm sure, can, can speak to largely. But if you think about consumer behavior right now, uh, you, you know, it wasn't uncommon. There was walk-in business to most hotels. People would just walk in the door and, and say, you got a room. Would you do that today? Probably not. Yes. You know, I'm going to read some reviews first because even uh, as St. especially within brands, right? Uh, brand A over here and brand A over there 
may not have the same standards. There could be very different quality standards that go with that. So yeah, your user generated content, you better be paying attention to these days because it's gonna carry more weight than ever. Mm -hmm. And know, thanks to Richard for pointing I out the fact actually, that you, right, I'm sorry. I've actually heard from some of our research that walk-ins are actually up in certain really? markets, which really? was shocking to me because I would have assumed the same as you. And so I think it, it depends a little bit on the type of market, um, but some people, maybe they just don't know what to expect. And so they just go ahead and walk in and see what's going on. But I bet they looked at Google before they right. went in. Exactly. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Everyone's got one of these now. So it's, yeah. it's very, very easy to quickly check on the fly whilst you're outside. Mm -hmm. And the next thing about reviews. Say hotels near me, <laughs> yeah. right? And automatically it's location based. Yeah, I put a post about that on LinkedIn that, that, that you know, the near me um, uh, keywords are actually uh, on, the re on the increase. Mm -hmm. they, they have yeah. settled. Sorry, Adele. The next thing about reviews is that it's free. Everybody, right. no matter you're a two-star hotel, three-star hotel, you've got a budget, you've got zero budget, but right. you can drive traffic to your hotel just based on being the top rated hotel in your comp set or market. I would, I would and, actually go you know, smiling is free. Happiness is free. Um, <laughs> kindness is free. A oh, culture oh, is pink. Oh, about loving the guest and lighting them up that's free it just takes work I mean, tomorrow's coming as well. thank you for coming up i mean i know that we sound like a broken record or to us <laughs> we do because every week we're addressing this but in fairness to richard's statement if we stop talking about this while it's still an important topic for those who haven't heard us talk about it before they might not think it's a, it, it, we might not be able to give them insights we actually are constantly harping on the fact that people need to understand these aspects of our industry. So in a way, as much as we may think we're going over a broken record, there's a lot of people that may not be exposed to our conversation uh, at any particular given week and they're hearing it for the first time sometimes. So uh, Plus there's hotels that are still not open yet. You know, so we've still got, uh, we've, we've, you know, not everybody's at the same stage. There, there are hotels that are still, you know, uh, operating at a reduced capacity or completely closed. Some hotels may never open. Uh, reopen again, which is, is truly sad. So, you know, the, the, the people at different stages of this cycle in different countries, in different areas as well. So the, the message, the, the, the good thing with this is we can go over this. We can we can talk about the things that have been, have been you know, perhaps not so good. Um, and, and hopefully, even if it's just one person or one hotel or whatever it will be, picks up and takes something away from this and actually makes a slight change to their policy or triple checks something instead of double checks it, or, you know, has a ban on underwear of all underwear in their hotel, whatever it may be, you know, then I'd be a happy man. I think that's the answer, Tris. Banning yeah. underwear in a hotel. That'll yeah. increase the sanitation. Random, random hotel underwear hangings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, if it happened to Trump, you'd know that would be a law that would be coming out. Project, <laughs> project Fruit of the Loom. Hey, uh, uh, Tamara's asking a question that probably is right up your alley. And that is getting collaboration with the other departments to be as invested into the satisfaction of a guest as they then find they, that, that she is for what she's doing. She, I mean, she seems to be a person that says, hey, I'm doing all that I can, cleaning all I can. How do I put a fire under other departments? Um, well, you, you know what? I think that at some point to get, uh, the, the team has to come together under the leadership of that hotel where he says, or she says, you know, you guys are the best. I see you put your heart and soul into everything you do. And I just want every single guest who comes into this hotel to appreciate how great you guys are. I want every single one of you to make sure to work together, to touch, not physically, <laughs> but to touch every guest journey along the way, to sparkle a little sunshine of every guest as you, as you prepare the room for them, as they, as you make the, the reservation, double check the reservation for them, as you choose the room for them, as you prepare the breakfast for, for the guests, every single thing you do, let's put a little extra love in it. Let's Played it in a way that is going to make them their eyes sparkle. Let's welcome them like 
every single guest is Beyonce or whoever you think is the coolest person around. Let's treat everybody as movie star special because you know, just imagine where they're coming from, the stressful life that they're they're leading, the, the terrible, you know, trauma that they may have had with their family uh, or their business so far. And now they're taking the time and they're spending a little time to have some good relaxation and bonding with their with their family in a beautiful setting where they can finally relax. Let's really put our whole heart into giving them a wonderful experience, a wonderful memory, and let them feel cared for and worry-free for just a little while. And let's all do it together. And let's chime in. If you see something that we should be doing better because somebody told you that something happened wrong, don't just say, oh, I'm sorry that happened. Here's a fruit plate. Talk about it. Level up that, that, that escalate, that, that comment so that the people who are making the, you know, decisions or who are doing the communication, almost most complaints have some aspect of a failure to communicate buried in them. Let us change those things. We value your input. We value every, every smile you give to every guest, every time you go the extra mile for someone. And we value your um, vocalizing what you see happening wrong and how can we and, and let's work together as a team and how to fix it just develop that kind of culture and that kind of excitement and just say we have a goal we want to be you know we we want to have a 90 or more percent guest satisfaction rating and we're not going to settle for less you know there's a very common expression that uh, perfection is the enemy of good or something like that well David Foster, the great um, musical uh, genius that he is, says that um, good is the enemy of excellence, of, of greatness. Let's just be great. Why not try to be great? We don't come to work every morning saying, let's be average. Let's get a, you know, 4.1, you know, average uh, guest satisfaction score, which is the typical uh, trip advisor, the the typical trip advisor to us for. That's the average. Let's do, we can do better. We have great people. Let's do better. I, so I'm somebody probably thought Chris needed more underwear. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm expecting Adele, at, at, at halfway through that, I was expecting the background of you to open up and a choir to start singing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> preach, it was brilliant. Uh, preach. It was brilliant. That was yeah. fantastic. And, really, and you're, really. You're absolutely right. You're, you're genuinely mm -hmm. you're right. It has to come from the top down. It has to come from um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the management of whatever you're doing. You know, whether it's running a hotel or running a ice cream parlor or whatever. You know, it really doesn't make any difference. It's got to come from the top. But it, again, it also needs to be communicated from the bottom upwards. And I know, um, you know, there's obviously the issue with, with 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 keeping people that Tara's mentioning there. That's going to make it more difficult. But then that to me suggests that there's uh, there's another problem. There's a deeper problem there than, you know, um, uh, other managers cleaning. There's there's a problem there with well, who who are the people that you're you're hiring and what's the why are they leaving so so quickly and so easily? I don't know what that is, and I don't know you know whether there is there, there is a deeper issue there. But you know that that will be one of the things. Um, that's that's one of the things that I would look at. But I, I I mean I often get in trouble whenever I've been working in organisations. I get in trouble because I make sure that my 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 voice and my opinion is most definitely heard. It, whether it's upwards, downwards, left or right, you know, if if there is something that I perceive to be wrong, I, I I'll, I'll be saying it. Ben can be a testament to that because he's been on the butt end of it quite a few oh, times. Oh, buddy, <laughs> I just let you stomp your feet. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so so tomorrow's followed up there by thanking Adele and then saying that it seems to be an issue, Trace. We've been on our own for a bit due to leaders being out. I mean, in my opinion, the moment a leader steps out is the time a leader steps up if mm. if the person who is above you and guiding you and, and has responsibility for that when they step out you step up and that's the chance for you mm -hmm. to lead without being a leader if that makes sense that leadership isn't about titles it's not about fancy laminated business cards it's not about having a desk and first class flights across the atlantic a, a leader is somebody who, who invigorates and drives their team to a common goal in my 
in my opinion. I should get my own choir, actually. If your leader has stepped out, that means you're the leader. Actually, yeah, yeah, a leader cool. didn't step out. A manager stepped out. It's time for a leader to step up because yeah. managers yeah. step out. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're yeah I, for sure. I think the, the one thing is, I would uh, add to Schull, all... the guy from uh, Ritz Carlton, uh, distinguishes managers are trying to control things while leaders are trying to empower things mm -hmm. and well, uh, yeah. inspire people with a vision. A good leader, it's almost like should be seen and never heard, so you know, but not quite the same. You know, a, a good leader is, is saying, "What can I do to support you?" As opposed to "Do as I say." You know, that that's totally different. And and the only time you need a leader is when you you know when you actually need them and you have a problem. But if if you've got things in the, in, in place, you've got the processes in place, you actually promote an environment where people will solve their own problems and probably just come to you for a little bit of you know, am I all right doing this? You know, Ben, ben and I, we, sorry, one second, Ben. Ben and I, we, we've done this um, uh, you know, repeatedly with the teams that we've built. We, we've been saying, if you've got an idea, yeah, go ahead and run with it. And uh, more often than not, people come to us with an idea and say, why are you telling us? Just go and do it. We'll back you no matter what. You know, as long as as long as long nobody yeah, dies at the end of it. There's, there's a part of leadership that's important, though, right? And that is setting the direction and setting the vision, yeah. giving them the scorecard or whatever it is. And I think that's the thing I would add to, to it, what Adele said, her inspirational speech i felt like i was at the end of a disney movie when the team that lost all season was about to win i'm, I'm ready to serve you but i think be, beyond the emotional connection which adele clearly made i think you've got to tap into one of my favorite phrases which is where focus goes energy flows which basically yeah. means in, unless you're talking about something people aren't going to put the energy in towards it right so the best properties that I see and the ones that have been successful now and have historically been successful, the ones that ultimately will survive, share a common trait, and that is they have a central scorecard. The KPIs that determine their success are the same KPIs that they talk about in every department. So if, which it should be, if guest satisfaction is one of your key performance indicators of success, then in every management meeting, every team meeting, you should be talking about how you're doing directionally on that metric and what you can be doing to positively impact that. And if you do that, the culture shifts, right? The culture shifts to focus on the things that make the biggest impact for your business based on your definition of success. That's what leadership has to define, but then they need to empower people and get out of their way and let them make individual decisions to be able to execute on that vision. Yeah, and I find that the best, at least for now, the best thing to track is where you rank on guest satisfaction in your market uh, in, on TripAdvisor. Not the value ranking, but the guest rating ranking. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, being in the in the top 10 is amazing, but being number one is the best. And it will do so much to drive traffic to your website. It does, and it's really hard to maintain. It just elevates your, your determination, because once you get to number one, there's, there's an expectation shift. You know, if you're, if you're seventh, eighth, or ninth, people have a great expectation, but it's not this expectation of perfection. When you get to number one, Everyone coming into that property expects nothing less than perfection, and you have to continue that to maintain. So getting to number one is really hard. Yeah. Staying number one is really, really hard. There was, there was always you know a discussion. It's, it's oh, not sorry, perfection in terms of opulence. It's, it's based on get, get satisfaction, which is what mm -hmm. this trip advisor is really fair about. It's different yeah. from the travel and leisure list, for example. Although yeah. they do have I've a seen two list. star hotels, number one in destinations. It, it, it doesn't think? matter what your service level is. It, it's, it's about your guest satisfaction. Look at Drury Hotels winning J.D. Powers. Right. I mean, in... They're, you know, I, I, I think that they may be rated as a luxury brand, but it is really, uh, it's not about opulence with them. It's about happiness. It's about your yeah. comfort. It's about taking care of people. And uh, and I really applaud and congratulate them. And, and it makes me so happy to see a hotel uh, in that class uh, take the top lead. Well done. Well done to Debris. Mm -hmm. 
So can I can I just ask um, uh, Ben? You uh, you went and got a book, and you were gonna you were gonna mention something about. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think it was going to be something about leadership, and I, I, obviously uh, it Mark was really having a conversation there. So I, I, it I, was. I, I, I'm intrigued to hear it. Uh, it's a book uh, called 21 Letters on Life Its Challenges" by Charles Handy, uh, a well-known um, academic, uh, economist, manager. Um, uh, and there's only one thing I've highlighted in the first half of the book, and he's talking about human resources. These are basically letters to his grandchildren. He wrote to his grandchildren so that they could read them and hear his opinions on things as they grew up. And the one, the one quote that I think is really relevant here is, work needs to be organized, things should be managed, but people can only be encouraged, inspired, and led. And I think it's such a distinction to make hmm. in that, it's the, it's the leading and the inspiration of people that's important and and mm-hmm. getting yeah you mentioned yourself just the way we approach things getting people to go and be free it's the inspiration if your if your line manager isn't there to inspire you and that can, that inspiration can be to do the day to day mundane things that just need to be done as well as creating new and exciting things if you, no one's there to inspire you to do that that's when people step up and uh, and take the mantle on for themselves. Mm-hmm. And it's great experience at low risk as well. So well, you, you, look at, you look at points in history where people look at what was inspirational. You look at like something like John F. Kennedy that said, no, we're not going to just put a man in space to match what was at the time of crisis. We're going to put a man on the moon. And they're like, you, you know, we don't even know how to launch a rocket without it blowing up right now. And you're talking about us getting to the moon when we've already got our asses whooped by some other country that already put a satellite in space. That aspirational we're not just going to put a car back on the racetrack to run around in circles and we're not planning on winning the race. We're going to win the race with this hunk of junk that we're going to make it kick everybody else's butt with. The idea of saying we want to be the best at it, not just be good enough, as you keep pointing out, Adele, is really what is that that rally point. Uh, and, and I'll add to the caveat what you said, Ben, the, the leadership aspect isn't about getting out of the way and giving the resources to the people, but reminding them that you did that. It is the selfless act of truly stepping out and making the people feel like they were the ones that created their success. And they, not until years later, they go back and go, oh my God, you made that happen. You got that out of my way, you know, but during that whole time, they never knew it. They just felt that, yeah, you know what? You're right. I made that happen. And you know, you just smile and know that I cleared a few yep. shadows out of your way and made exactly. sure this thing came down. Every team member has a million dollar idea in their head. And as a leader, you've just got to get it out of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, you need to make people feel powerful. Um, and, you know, one time uh, there was a situation in a hotel and I was trying to figure out what is the morale problem here? What is what is the issue? And uh, so I went to sit in that office for a, a few weeks at that property. And I kept hearing at all the meetings from the best people on the team. But I would hear them say, oh, don't feel like you need to answer questions like that. Just pass them off to me. Just pass that off to me. If anybody asks you anything about this, don't worry about it. Just pass them off to me. Well, the desk heard that so often that they started to feel like they must be fools who are not intellectually capable of making good decisions and being helpful in these areas. And I just sat down with that team, which were the best hearted, smart people, and uh, but they were just doing the wrong thing unintentionally and said, you know, you have great people. They can be future general managers. They can be future directors of sales and marketing. You know, talk to them like you are training them for the next step of their career and let them help you because that by letting them help you by empowering them to be creative and use their full mind and full passion for hospitality to take care of that guest as quickly as possible, we're giving a better experience for everybody. And and you'll have more time to do what you really need. And it worked like magic. And if, it if, was just a mental obstacle that were, was in people's ways. But it, when the desk started feeling, I'm respected, my opinion matters, my contribution um, and my, uh, you know, the trust that my company has in me for being able to make good decisions based on 
an understanding of our goals and the way our business works, etc. You know, I feel great about going the extra mile and taking care of customers. But for a while there, it was like, I'm afraid to do anything because I'm going to get in trouble. And right. that is a disaster for your if you really want to frighten the, uh, the, the the person who's who's doing it, I'll, I'll take care of that and all the rest of it. You know, when you're talking about training these people as being future leaders, future managers, future whatever it would be, they could also be your future boss. <laughs> Indeed. Remember that. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. You never know. What, you know, you never again. What goes around comes around. Especially in the hospitality industry, as much as you know, we're talking it's global, ten percent of global GDP. It's a really small industry. It's a really small industry. There's a piece of Tamara's comment that we haven't quite touched on, though, in that she's talking about other managers, right? They have a relationship like this. She doesn't report to them. They don't report to her. So how does she inspire essentially her similarly leveled managers who definitely managers should be focused on all of these things already in order to be in this position, right? So I think that here you can also employ some of the same inspirational techniques sideways, but look at how many potential department managers are out without a job right now that want to come in and do an excellent job. So just reminding even your coworkers and saying, wow, we are so lucky that we have these positions right now. I know that it's stressful. I know there's a lot to cover, but you know, how can I support you guys in your departments? You know, from my perspective, one of the things I'm doing is I'm cleaning X, Y, and Z because that's so critical. Everything I've been researching says cleanliness is the number one thing. How can I support you guys so that you can achieve that in your departments as well. And it's kind of a hint to them saying, hey, you need to be achieving this in your department. But it's a nice approach as well that reminds them that there are probably 50 people who would love to have their job right now. And so it's not that difficult. Line level staff is really problematic right now. And depending what happens with the unemployment, that may shift thing again we may see more people willing to return to work but at the managerial level there are so many available people because of the cuts that have been made to staffing across the industry so it's important that we're all putting our best forward and really being grateful for the positions that we have and saying okay how can i return this to my employer in the form of excellence and everything that i'm doing and how's it going to look in someone's resume if uh, if you're part of the hotel that you know knows had took a nosedive because of cleanliness or because of issues right. or whatever it's going to be? You're not going to be terribly employable back in the get uh, you know back in the game simply because we're talking, going back to the process thing. If you can't follow a simple process, you know it, and you can't get a team, you know your team that you're directly responsible to follow a simple process. Yeah, you may not be a leader, you may not you know be fantastic, but at least do something simple. You're not going to be terribly employable at the, at the back end of it. And, and if that doesn't work, then I, I always suggest my fight. You know, with, oh. with, with not managing side by side. You know, I, I think what my colleague's trying two, to say: two managers go in, one comes out. There are different ways to solve this problem, <laughs> uh, and we should do it amicably and not stab our colleagues. Yeah, that's um, right. I, I I I like I like that suggestion, Lizzie, Lily, because it's it's a little bit uh, it's 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 nice, but it's a little bit it's what's not being said. How can I support you in doing this? Suggests it ain't getting done. <laughs> it ain't getting done. It's and nice. this is me nicely telling you. Whilst I'm going to remind you how many people are unemployed, how can I support you to keep your job? when there's thousands of people that would love your job. I'm just, I am a humble servant. I'm all about you. <laughs> I love it. It's such, a, it's such a boss question though, isn't it, Ben? It's such it a is, boss. it is. I it ask is. in a yeah, house like question. Well, well so. and, and sometimes the opposite approach happens to, it can be effective too. That there's a lot of psychology studies that show that if you, if you ask someone for a favor, then it, t it tightens the bond between you and they are more likely to open up to you and trust you in the future. So, so sometimes you can flip it rather than going to them and offering them something. Maybe you, you start the relationship the other way and build the relationship by saying, I really need your help and I know you're busy, but could you lend me your knowledge or your expertise or give me your opinion on this? 
because that that creates that connection that then they're going to trust you more and that you can build upon that to get a deeper relationship. Don't abuse it and don't do something that doesn't make sense, but genuinely look for their help. Then they're going to feel like they can trust you to do the same. Sometimes, Modeling that behavior can help. Sometimes the difficulty with that is that you, you end up getting a job back yourself when you're trying to get the other person to do the job. <laughs> and, and that can be a tricky Sometimes. one. Yeah, I, I think with the uh, the way Lily mentioned it and what Ben was talking about, it, it's you know, obviously read books. It, it, it's the how can you or, or how how can I expect you to do it or how can you know how can we do this together by asking a how question? You're actually getting the other person to come up with the answer and come up with the solution. Mm -hmm. And it, it's 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 the phrasing of the question and, and and how you actually ask that question that puts the emphasis on the other person. See, I'm, 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 I'm in the Arnold Schwarzenegger Conan mode, which is uh, destroy your enemies and hear the lament of the women. You know, it's just, it's just we're not doing their job. Again, <laughs> again, <laughs> listeners, we're not, we're not suggesting you destroy <laughs> the violent knife any of your colleagues at all. I think Ben is like, that is not a role I would take on for this group of people. You are all on your own. To be fair, Ben's been my legal counsel for about 14 years. You know, I advise you not to mention Take a knife, anymore. two enter, one leave. You know, guess what? New housekeeping director. <laughs> it's a merging of departments is what it is. Wow. You know, it's... Yeah. It, it keeps, By the time the GM comes back, there's one person. It's like Thunderdome. One person is still there. <laughs> Everybody else is gone. Place is clean as a whistle. <laughs> yeah. The good news is we've cut our payroll. Payroll is like <laughs> Literally well, cut our payroll. Yes. <laughs> Significantly. <laughs> Sheesh. Oh, this is a marketing, yeah. marketing twist of things. And it's one of them related to Delta and all the rest of the airports. Although uh, the... Uh, Airlines, where some airlines have decided, like American Airlines, it says, look, this, this middle seat thing is just PR. It has nothing to do with it. And then other airlines have said, no, we're going to keep this in, the middle seat empty and we're not going to be jacking our rates and so forth and so on. And boom, look who got the business. Yeah. You know, it's this perspective shift of like, you may think it's this, but wrong answer. We are doing better business. We are keeping the middle seat empty and we are growing back. Now, that being said, airlines doing business now are never going to do bit no not never excuse me it's going to be a while before they get back to a business level prior to what this has happened especially from the corporate travel perspective because it's scuppered yeah it's yeah scuppered. It's scuppered. yeah the word from <laughs> such a good word yeah i want to grab a couple of the articles for it, but i just thought i'd throw that in there because it does relate to a little bit of what we just said so I'm going to grab those articles. Go yeah, ahead. but you're right. There, there's no way on earth I would want to fly in a middle seat these days. I didn't like it before, and sure as hell I ain't going to do it now. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's and true. I wouldn't fly if I didn't know that the middle seat was empty. Exactly. No. Uh, it all depends on who sat either side of me, you know, if I'm honest. You know, if, 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 it, if it's my kids, no, it ain't happening. No, you know. <laughs> well, stranger, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> But again, again, this also goes to the leverage of opportunity because now they're saying that if you do make the effort to go face to face, you are really amping up the importance of that corporate dialogue because you are putting yourself through that process to get to the person to be in front of them, not on a Zoom, not on a, a Brady Bunch tile, but I'm going to go and come and talk to you because it's that important to me. So it's actually elevated that business travel thing eventually. So I'm sure there'll be leveraging of that as time goes forward that says, no, I'll come to you and talk to you. I mean, Lily, you went and actually traveled because it was business. Yep. yep. I'm sure that added to the amplification of, of, their, of them saying, wow, you made the trip, you're here. You know, it's important that you're here. That's very cool. And there are certain types of business that are just better conducted in person. We all know that. And this is coming from somebody who makes their living on remote business, right? But there's still a need for that human touch from time to time. And honestly, it was also huge for me. I probably could have done it remotely, but I knew that for myself, I needed to step out of my environment a little bit, even if there was some risk to it. And get myself in a different frame of mind in order to keep being a creative and effective leader for my own company. 
Mm-hmm. Which is quite interesting because we had the, the conversation last week, uh, if, I, uh, if I remember correctly, Ben, where you said that face-to-face was going to die out completely. Um, scuppered, Tris, I said scuppered. Scuppered, scuppered, scuppered. scuppered. that's the word. And, and, and I said, uh, we've got a, I've actually forgot to tell you, I've got a meeting this week where I was going face-to-face. And didn't we win that business? <gasps> oh, oh, yeah, you guys are just putting out your website and you're already divided. I don't know. No, <laughs> no, Real groom beard versus uh, the Yang black t shirt hadn't bathed in months. Oh, oh, uh, I, I think, uh, I, I, I think, this, and, and this isn't necessarily something for a public forum. <laughs> <laughs> This could have been done with a uh, a call afterwards. Uh, but I would suggest that you may not have needed to, to do that. I mean, I, like anybody, would love for eight hours away from my family. I'm sorry, I'm, ki- I'm kidding. I love you all. Um, but whether, I mean, yeah, obviously... It's going to, at the moment, it's going to be easier for people to do business face to face. There's something very different about being able to pick up on nonverbal communication and the feel and the tone of a way of a conversation is going. But I heart back to the last five years. I mean, look at all the other clients we've signed that we've never met and we are never going to meet. Hush now, hush. If you want to do face to face, I agree. I would love to be face to face with people, but. Is that creating an inconvenience for them? Because keep in mind, they might be working from home themselves. So where exactly are you going to meet? You're gonna maybe go to a Starbucks. They're not in the office. But let's assume you do get them in the office. Now everybody's concerned about, okay, do we wear face masks? Do we, you know, how do we keep everything clean? All the things that have to be t- taken into consideration along with that. Is it more convenient for them to meet you by Zoom? Let, let me ask a hypothetical question. If you were forced, like as I'm not even going to consider doing business with you, Unless you show up on my doorstep, does that change your opinion of it? It massively well, depends on the value of the client. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, not. See, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely saying go, go find somebody else. Sorry. I mean, I don't, I don't like care so- how big it is. You can make my day. You could make me a millionaire, but that means I got to come kiss the ring. I don't kiss rings. Yeah, but to be fair, that's, Lauren, that's you are the most stubborn person on this side. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what you're getting at is the the approach, right? Like, hey, I really. It's one thing to say like, hey, we're very family oriented. For example, we did some work in Portugal. They flew us to Portugal first class to close the business on their own dime because it was so important to them that there was that face-to-face connection as part of their culture. However, the way you're describing it, Lauren, is more like a threat, right? Yeah. Like if somebody's threatening you, like you're not going to get the business if you're not coming to visit me. I think that has less to do with the travel and more to do with, is this the kind of attitude that I want to deal with? Right. Every day? That's how I kind of look at it. That forced, that forced, I don't care about you. It's only about me perspective. I, would, right. I don't want to get in business with those people. 28% the of I, also people. Have a, I also have a rule that it better to be, you know, you have two contracts you sign with somebody, the one you do sober and the one you do drunk. Always do both. <laughs> of people, according to Fuel Travel's last study, believe that it is... That was legitimate. Sounds really legitimate. (laughs) (laughs) These are the people who say, I don't want to be forced to wear masks, but you best keep everybody else away from me because I'm scared of them. They say it's a narcissistic trait. Yeah. These are people who also wanted a wall between you and Mexico, but, you know, there we go. That's completely different. Remember when that was a topic of discussion? Uh, That seems such a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Brexit, not forget yeah. Brexit. Oh, yes. uh, oh, it was right. great that the comment, Stuart, you made last week, I actually wrote down um, us and them and the us versus them and the tribal need for masks. Uh, I thought mm-hmm. it was a, it was piercing is what I thought that was piercing. It got to the mm-hmm. heart of the issue. Um, yeah. It was very much a, I want to be safe, but I don't want to do anything to be safe. I just want to, everyone else to make me safe. Exactly. You bad That's people. Right. <laughs> Holly's in the peanut gallery. She shared her survey she did about uh, the middle seat dialogue a little bit as to would you think about better to raise the price and keep the seat empty and so forth. And um, survey says 52% higher price, less people. Mm. Well, there's still, you know, still if, I'm, if I'm traveling, I don't really care if the price remains the same, I might be a little annoyed if the price is higher than usual, but I don't see the need to discount. But I do like that there's less people. When I flew through LAX, I saw the people from my flight and about 30 others in the entire trip. 
to, to say to elevate our game and conversation, like I mentioned earlier in the show, here's an advanced dialogue that's been beneficial to the people I've had in Indianapolis, because Indianapolis, is, ironically, is a hub of uh, small airports, uh, executive airports. We do this business travel as in salespeople going to visit clients or uh, corporate travelers having to go to corporate mothership, or we relate to it from the up, from the downward to the up position. We don't look at the top to the down positions. I, I own a big company. I got to go see my businesses. I own a private plane. I want to go see stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. We've had some decent success in targeting private flight charters. We've had decent success in pe people that have said, I don't want to get on the big planes. I'll pay the extra to get on the small planes and I can financially handle that. I can pay the double amount, which is, it, ironically, there's not a big gap between trying to upscale your big plane ride to just going on a private charter plane. And there's a really intricate network of, of private charters that people use their, you know, they own a plane, but they lease it out all the time. And it's a part of networks of people flying all over the place. There's enough people like that, that we get to see some business that don't, aren't having to stay at the Ritz. They need functionality. It's by the airport. It's to my business. I'm back on the plane. I'm out and gone. I don't need the pamper spot. I don't need this and this. I, you know, I'm still running a financial business. I just need to stay at a hotel that is accommodating and clean. That's in, that's people don't think about things like that. Then and you these are those little grains of rice that build up a bowl of rice. It's just you know this is a piece of business you can get. It's a dozen, half dozen, whatever, but it's somebody that you didn't have before. So just that kind of thought process that you kind of have to flip it over sometimes and look at it from a couple of different ways, but that's business. And there's, there's more of those chat flights going around at the moment uh, as well. Yeah. I've, I've seen quite a few um, uh, looking for um, uh, uh, digital marketing agencies to actually advertise the chat flight themselves. So, you know, there's clearly, clearly more that they're trying to do, or at least try to capitalize on this, this industry sector. It's, it, you know, it, you're right. Keep your eyes open. Look at what's going around, and if you can then have the knock on effect, uh, knock on effect of what their additional tech support, companies, tech support companies right now are wicked solid with that. They need to send crews because they actually have to go down to the denizens of the 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 servers, and they got to go to the room itself, and they got to be jacking cables and cable monkeying it and everything else to do mm -hmm. the stuff. They can't do that remote. It's not about telling somebody unplug this and plug this here. They have to go and handle the hardware issues. They have to go in, and they usually go in teams because it one person usually doesn't solve that stuff. It's usually it pairs in twos and fours. And those people go on these planes because it's that important for them to get there to do the solutions. Yeah, you can't do that over Zoom. No, 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 the other red one. No, 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 don't put that one. Oh god, it's no, 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 no. so <laughs> you screen goes blank. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so thank you, Holly, for bringing that back to our attention about the middle seat thing. You should join us. Lily's well, right. You should pop in sitting in the peanut gallery like that. So open it up for an. an it, there's like a bunch to of sit there and judge us. That's all. Cool. Yes. She's good at judging us. So. Is she judging us? <laughs> yeah, she's sitting off and judging us. Um, so I don't want to miss some of the Google stuff. I have I have an article separate from the article that. that uh, uh, um, Robert gave us as to Google my business. I have a, I have a bit of an ax to grind and something new as to us lack using to Google my business. It's, it's one of the most fundamental tools that Google is truly leaning into. And there's a lot of stuff they're dumping into this that nobody's really utilizing. Mm -hmm. It's stuff that they're, you know, they've, 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 they've added a lot of COVID aspects to it. They have a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of their certification thing, 50 bucks a month thing. I don't think that's really into our market yet. It's more for retail, I think, in service industries. But yeah, it's being tested in certain markets for, for services, like um, repair services, things like that. It's not available for hotels. But it is for restaurants. Yeah, restaurants probably could be helpful for that. Yeah, yeah so the, um, especially ones that do delivery during COVID. So I, I put a yeah. post on uh, this uh, as well myself around the, 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 the testing. It's almost like a meta search, but, you know, for, for non-hotel uh, industry, the adv adverts within um, uh, Google My Business. And one of the areas that they were talking about as being a potential issue is restaurants where you've got an OTA style system where you've got, you know, um, uh, bigger uh, app delivery services advertising on the Google My Business listing of a restaurant um, or, a, or a takeaway or whatever it would be. And, and given the fact that um, uh, COVID-19 has now uh, opened up the eyes to a lot of restaurants, that there is a takeout market there, that, that there is the potential that could continue long after COVID 
you know, your favorite restaurant that was, you know, always difficult to get a, a, a seat at could now have a very lucrative takeaway menu that it would, they would be crazy if they were to stop that, you know, they get the, get the, uh, uh, the, the covers coming back in, but obviously that going in. So it, it opens up an interesting, um, an interesting conundrum and or, or almost a hotel OTA like conundrum uh, with uh, Google playing around with this, but they don't care as long as they get paid. Well, the takeout is happening. not the same, though, is it? I mean, the food isn't the same. Takeout is just not the same. They should charge less for that. You yeah. know what? It, is, is speaking of which, you know, I think that uh, people have made quite a good campaign to contact restaurants directly for takeout rather than going through one of the. Um, delivery services that charge, I think, 30% mm -hmm. to the restaurant. And uh, and I wonder why, why I, I don't think that we've made a similar campaign as hotels. I, I, I think it's yeah, because... Wow, it, Hilton both did, right? The Book Direct campaign and the yeah. Ace Book Direct. The, the, yeah, but those, they don't. They both did made a big... I, I think the difference is here is, is that the um, uh, the likes of Booking.com and Expedia kind of they were one of the earliest adopters of uh, of internet advertising and and the business model that they created that they almost educated an entire world to a certain degree that that's how you book a hotel room that's how you can book a hotel room online whereas the restaurants and the um uh, the the delivery services that are coming coming through right now they're still it's still very new it's still it, it's not it hasn't been around for 20 years it, it's not it, it's not as well established they're still fighting for market share between themselves at the moment here so the, there is the extra education that, that people are picking up and saying well, hang on a second <clears throat> we're not gonna we're not gonna go the way the hotels are going Let's yeah, try and and some of it's technology based though. Like we did a study, this is two or three years ago now, and one of the questions was, do you visit the hotel website prior to making a booking? Regardless of how you book, whether you book on an OTA or direct or over the phone or whatever, do you visit the hotel website before you book? And 87% of people said, yeah, they do. So it's it's not that people don't know they can go to the hotel website and book direct. It's, it's that it's easier or that there's more convenience or they trust an Expedia more than they do booking direct. So I think we need to continue well, to educate, but we need to invest in better infrastructure. We need better booking engine technology that works on mobile. You know, we need yeah. better copywriting. We we need, uh, there's a lot of optimization that I'd say, you could give me any hotel website, even even our own, and there's opportunity to drive up incremental conversion rate on yeah, every website out there. There's some opportunity in there too, going back to the restaurants part. Uh, taking out the chains and the franchises that all have tech, watch and say all have technology, but have better technology. But look at your independent restaurant, family owned restaurant in whatever town that you're in. Go to their website. Can you order and pay for food online? And it has astonished me how many of them don't have what, the restaurant equivalent of a booking engine, right? Mm -hmm. and within my, where I live, I had one place that said, nope, now you got to call us. Well, you couldn't call them because they had limited staff and nobody was answering the phone. You couldn't even get through on the phone. You had to actually go to physically to place your order in the first place and then wait 30 minutes for it to get done. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, and even if you that. could, right, even if you could, you still have to put in your credit card details and it's a right. buffle, right? And it, it, there's friction there that if I go to Uber Eats, I don't have that friction because they already exactly. have my payment and I click, 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 save. So so the, fric the friction of transaction, humans are lazy. All of us, we're all lazy. Yeah. We're going to do the path of least resistance every time. And, well, and our morals and might say we should book direct or we should do this, but if it's easier not to, we're probably going to do what's easiest. But you know what? We we work with Sabre, we work with Pegasus, we work with TravelClick and these companies. Why, if someone has booked before someplace else through those systems, why can't it be that easy for that person's profile to also with that with those services retain it so that it is put push of a button to book a well, reservation. To do with the, the, the payment processor is not Pegasus or Sabre, right? The payment processor is, is going to be the individual hotel. So you get into a whole bunch of security situations and challenges when you start mm -hmm. doing the shared payment. Yeah, I, th right. I think that's why you're seeing a trend towards things like Google Pay and, and uh, or Google Wallet and Apple Pay and Amazon Cart and, and 
I think that'll be the way that we we trend as an industry. But honestly, the holdup right now on that front in hotels is the PMS systems. The PMS mm. systems will not let you use a lot of these payment opportunities right now. Right. And that, that's a major problem. You know, that leads to what we're going to see happening. We talk about everything being easy. And by the way, I've got to drop off here in about five minutes. So just real quickly, you know, we, we have the, the, the direct booking movement, if you will, that started particularly with some of the brands, butting heads with the OTAs and so on. We go through this, this, this COVID crisis and we think about how do we come back out of it? And as much as I can sit here and tell you that direct bookings are more important than ever because they are, because you want to be able to control that narrative on the guest and so on. The reality of the matter is that we're, we are all going to look for, by we all, I mean the industry, look for what is the easiest way for me to start getting business back. And the answer will be the OTAs, Expedia, Hotwire, Booking.com, they'll all step in and say, we'll sell your rooms for you. Why do I say this? Because we did it before, right after 9-11. Look what we all did. We sold our soul to the OTAs saying, please put heads in beds for me. And then we spent 10 years trying to get that business back again. I, I and then we did it again in 2009, the same thing again. So, yeah. Oh, well, look at what Hotels.com is offering. They're offering a buyback on uh, rebookings where they drop the commission and give you a 15% discount as a guest to put the money back in your wallet with them. They hang on the money and you can rebook with the same hotel as long as you do by the end of this year for to, uh, before April next year. They're already coming into ways of trying to how to figure to go over and keep your business without losing it by going back to the same hotel again. That just came up. Well, look, the, look uh, at the flip side, what Expedia is doing with their sell your soul to the devil kind mm -hmm. of deal, which, which might work and make sense for some people. But for a lot, it, it's giving away the one advantage you have. You know, in the short term, you might gain a little bit in the long term. That's going to bite you in the butt if you want direct. Uh, and and uh, the answer to it also is that, unfortunately, all of these entities, the Nexuses, the Amadeuses, that you know, AK Travel Click, all these other ones, nobody's home right now. They've let so many people go that their status is the same as it was before it all happened. And nothing's being improved or fixed on or put together based on the new demands. So even if even if it's like a brilliant idea that you have, which is true, why can't we do this? There's nobody building it. And the brands are just as bad. Nobody in the brand is at home yeah. right now to even do this fundamental stuff. So everything is just sitting as it on a shelf the way it was from before. And these other little new industries, you know, like fuel travel, who are you know dominating the world, are coming with solutions on how to do some things that aren't being done by the other providers because it's a necessary demand right now. This is, you know, touchless keyless entry, touchless payments, you know, touch, you know, be able to go over and make reservations at restaurants without having to deal with somebody that goes, yeah, what you want? How many people, you know, be able to do it online and say, boom, I got to go there and I want to get something, you know? You know, what I, what I find really interesting, though, is, is the mindset of the hotel industry with the OTAs. I, I, ben and I have had this conversation so many times that, you know, because we're, we're digital marketing specialists, we know what the Internet can do. We've done it in so many other industry sectors before we joined this industry. Um, we, we know what's capable. We know what's possible. And we're sat there, we've sat there and said before, you don't need the OTAs as much as you think you do, even right now, even in this crisis. And we've just signed um, a, a brand new hotel to us. It's an amazing hotel. Um, we're lo really looking forward to working with them. It happened to be one I went to visit face to face, but that's a different story. Um, but the, this hotel has actually turned around and said, we're not using OTAs. And for the month of July, since the, we've opened up here in the UK, their occupancy level is higher this this July than it was the same period last year when they were using OTAs. Their ADR is higher. The length of stay is up. Now, yeah, fair enough. A, a lot of that's going to be part of furlough, the whole COVID-19 situation. But I went to another hotel, literally uh, within a mile of, of this this same hotel to talk about the same things. And they're not even open yet, and they're August when they're opening up. It looks terrible. It looks absolutely terrible. And they're trying. Their 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 strategy was to just go to the OTAs, just just put it all through the OTAs and see. But everyone's yeah, trying to do that. that. Everyone's trying yeah. to do that, and everyone's trying to compete for the space on the OTAs. So someone who's doing something different. Going direct, getting the message out there, because no hotels are actually advertising on the uh, on the direct platforms, like you know Google, Bing, MetaSearch, whatever it would be. The cost per clicks are cheaper, and there's less competition right now. This is not rocket science. This is very simple. Loads of people go to one place, fighting for for, uh, for for heads and beds and eyeball attention. Not very many people going over here, and it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, but it's. Again, it, it's, it's trying to convince somebody to open up their wallet and, and actually take that gamble and take that risk. And it's easy for me to say 
because we've done it we see it uh, i'm uh, ben and i would say we're, we're definitely gonna we, we, we already know what the results are gonna be but i i know uh, with with this chap uh, he's got another hotel there are only two independents got another hotel we uh, we're, we're going to start trialing uh, meta search with him and he and i said you know are you using otas yet there he said yeah he said do you want me to start I'm like, what? Okay. I said, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, okay, let, let, let's try it. So he's going to stop using MetaSearch, and we know that the, the case study for that is going to be absolutely phenomenal. Would you? Yeah. You know, it's in the heart of the Lake District. It's fantastic. Speaking of MetaSearch, team, before we lose you, since you are the founding founder of two organizations right now, uh, where is it they can find you and more, know more about you? Sure. You can reach out to me, Dean, at BasecampMeta.com, also Dean at MetaSearchMarketing.com. Uh, difference between those two, BasecampMeta.com is really designed for training purposes, particularly for agencies to how to use MetaSearch. Uh, Basecamp, our MetaSearchMarketing.com is designed for helping hoteliers to actually run their MetaSearch programs and getting you connected with the right vendors, such as Tris and Ben over here, and people that can actually help you run those programs and uh, get you to the right uh, technology stack. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you next week. Hi, Dean. Thank you. Bye, Dean. Bye, Bye. Bye. I also didn't want to lose a chance before, I don't want to lose Lily before this one. There's two articles that I wanted to ask you to talk about a little bit was the length of stay strategy article and the uh, uh, hotel pricing article. And the reason I brought this up, I think I think I sent it to everybody from uh, a quarantine I was on with BC, uh, British Columbia, uh, HSMI chapter. Uh, Amadeus was very nice. Uh, Anthony Wu, great guy. Uh, you know, I complained about the fact that so many people were laid off and so forth. He's one of the people that have been retained and he's really trying to rethink data usage data functionality and so forth. And with Canada being locked down and domestic travel only, he's been sharing a lot of really cool data. And I, I sent that over to everybody, I think, uh, from, from our group here. And one of the things was talking about how the pricing strategy is, you know, everyone was maintaining pricing and now it seems to be going down. Like they're trying to do this, this stupid, no, I wouldn't say stupid, the not so brilliant thing of reducing prices to try to inspire demand cycle. And I know that, you know, Lily, you've been an advocate of do not touch your rate or don't try to think you have to discount your rate, I should say, uh, to compensate for the de demand shift. So between those two conversations, before I lost you, I want to make sure you were able to hit both of those and say, like, how does length of stay play into this and how does rate variations play into this? Yeah, for sure. So length of stay in particular, we're finding a couple of, uh, different kind of incongruent responses depending on your market, right? Uh, some are keeping a pretty similar length of stay and it's really focused around weekends. Others are starting to see more of a pattern of a three or four night weekend stay. And others are successfully capturing the office away from home group who is tired of being in their home office, but also needs privacy and, you know, obviously the, the we works of the world are kind of, uh, too high touch for most people right now, unless you've already gotten a private office. So those who really want to get out an office separately are coming in for five night stays midweek. So really my, my best advice around that is to watch your own trends over the past couple of months, because when you look at using length of stay restrictions as a tool, number one, you never restrict unless you expect to sell out. So the only time to use a restriction is when you have more demand than your capacity can handle. But if you are in that scenario, and I know a lot of luxury uh, resorts right now are actually in that scenario, they're raising rates uh, even well over last year's rates and they can't slow down demand because people are desperate to get out to these activity, luxury, spread out kind of destinations. Um, but if you see that you have enough capacity to be at 150%, for example, based on the demand that's coming in, then at how many of those are two night stays versus three night stays or four night stays and use that data to set the right strategy for your stay. Um, and to your point on rate, uh, it's, I, I know you didn't mean it that way, but I wouldn't say it's a don't touch your rate. It's more that you have to be on top of those rates to adjust to the changing market conditions, but don't suddenly be, you know, the lowest rate and maintain your positioning in the market and know that if your comp set drops to 89, 99 doesn't necessarily put you out of the running if you have a proper marketing behind it that allows you to set yourself apart from a value proposition. Now, if they're at 99 and you're at 104, 
oddly enough, psychology uh, being what it is, that can put you out of the running. So understand where those thresholds are and make sure that you're pricing appropriately to your market as you would have previously based on your value proposition. Well said. Yeah, Stuart, you and, and fo focus on adding value before you look at dropping rate. Like if, if you Absolutely. have the choice, you know, always look at what can I add? What, what, what incentives can I give to people? And, and, and that might be, you know, food and beverage credit. Also, you know, there's a lot of things you could add depending on your situation, but we're seeing that at that along with reassurance of the safety protocols seems to be able to gain a higher rate right now. If you add something versus slashing rates. But it's it's funny, back on episode 149 of the Fuel Podcast, Lily was on and we were talking about rate and her, her number one rule, she did the five tips, which is still very relevant. And the number one tip was don't lower your rate. And then we talked about that for a while. And then her number two was number one's a myth, so ignore what we just said. Because sometimes you do have to lower your rate and it, and it really is about your your unique situation, your, your comp set, your market your audience, all those things. Let me ask a I'm question. I'm very proud of the fact that that podcast is still relevant because that's hard to that's do amazing. these days. Yeah, <laughs> right. that's the truth. So let me, let me ask something. There, there's been some pushback from the, the properties that they are being challenged on their rates because their service profiles have changed. There is no buffet mm -hmm. breakfasts anymore. There is not the daily cleanings of rooms. And people see that as a cost savings to the hotel. And we try to counter that by saying yes, but the PPE requirements and the other things that we've had to adopt and so forth uh, and packaging and so forth compensate for some of that stuff. How, how does that discussion roll out for everyone in the sense of, okay, so we're not giving a buffet, but we're giving you a grab and go. Um, we don't yeah. have, you know, whatever. Sorry. We, we've done that. We've tried to encourage folks to replace value, you know, and it's not apples to apples and sometimes it can be perceived different differently, but sometimes opportunity arises from that. And I think I mentioned this on the show before, we've had a handful of properties that are seeing massive increases in F and B sales because they've gone from a buffet to a grab and go or some kind of boxed breakfast that they supply to the, to either to the door, you can come pick up from the, the front desk, but it's included in the rate. So the guest is saying, okay, well, breakfast is still included but they're not stuffing their face on like 500 rashes of bacon like they do at a buffet and, and then not eating, skipping lunch and just going out to a seafood buffet for dinner. Um, so they're, they're seeing that lunch sales are up through the roof and, and even dinner sales, is a, it's a knock on as well. So, you know, I think you've got to look at the big picture of what what is my, my share of wallet of the guest, not just from the room, but from my mm -hmm. ancillary services as well and look at it from that perspective. And maybe there is an argument to lower rate if you feel like you're going to get it back up from the second wallet. But you've also got a mindset thing as well, haven't you? If you've got um, a lot of uh, leisure travel coming to your uh, your property right now, um, we're going through, we're going back to some of the things we were talking about there and, and, and we've constantly talked about the cleanliness. If I'm staying at a hotel, I've obviously gone through the whole decision-making process that this hotel is going to be right for me. I'm, I'm you know, once I'm going to feel safe that the, 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 the cleanliness levels are to the standard that I want. But perhaps you're not going to know what that's going to be like outside at a restaurant somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So there is the opportunity there where if there is F&B on site, if there is a restaurant on site, there, there is the upsell because you've got a captive audience that's yep. perhaps a little bit more trepid about going out than they once were you know, mm -hmm. four or five months ago. So it doesn't surprise me that F and, F and B is going up. In actual fact, you know, should really be pushing, um, trying to trying to get more more out of that or wherever you can with, with whatever opportunity. Which is which is where that value proposition can come in because mm -hmm. you know we we've seen and it, you know it's different than couponing, but it, it's similar in a way in that if you give some kind of credit towards on property mm -hmm. F and B, it gets more participation. So uh, I think that that's the kind of thing you should be playing at playing with right now and before you drop right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know what's interesting too, talking about restaurants, um, one of the other drawbacks, not just with cleanliness, but accuracy of information, because I feel like, you know, your individual restaurants aren't necessarily doing as good of a job with their Google My Business listings and things mm -hmm. like that. And I've seen 
both sides of things, either restaurants saying they're not open for dine-in, but they actually are, or that they are open for dine-in and they're actually not. And it's specifically, okay, we're open for dine-in, but we're not open for this. And so it's frustrating to feel like you could show up at a restaurant that maybe you selected it for something specific that you're craving. You've gone a little out of your way to get there and now you can't even really eat there. So mm -hmm. you, know, you have to call ahead for everything, whereas otherwise the information's right there at your fingertips. And again, it comes down to not just making it clean and safe, but making it easy for the guest to make a decision where they don't, you're not adding stress. Nobody wants to go on a vacation and be more stressed than they were when they were at home. Clean, safe, and accurate. I yeah. Think is what yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that, that's been pretty much the progress of communication that we've been trying to lean on to. Now, talking about a little bit of advanced dialogue, and it kind of is funny because you know Robert sent this article out, which was uh, the, um, the extra places, Netflix tourism sites, um, the one that he talks about, where people are grabbing these unique places to go peek and poke at because they're a fan of a particular show or something like this. It's ironic that it came up when he put it in this article because when I was first having a discussion with the sales team of, of a client, you know, they approached it very traditionally, like, okay, well, these groups aren't traveling and I can't get this. Back. Everything was why I can't, why I can't, they won't, they aren't, they're not doing. And then we started talking about, well, what do you do around there? What's still, if somebody just wanted to go drive around, if you talk to a lot of people right now, a lot of people are just getting in the car and driving around. Just, you know what, I just got to get out of the house or something. I want to go drive around, at least in, around here we are. Um, and that same thing I could from them. And all of a sudden they started thinking about the wineries the farm, farmer's markets, the little parks to go to, the places that are low density places. And then they just started writing stuff, more and more stuff on the board. And they're like, well, wait a minute, didn't that TV show do such and such next door? And all of a sudden they start coming with these crazy things of like, if, I, if I'm here at the hotel, because we, we, we just to predicate this, we had a little bit of advanced conversation. First thing is talking about what you're doing for cleanliness. The second thing is what is available for you for your basic needs, like what restaurants are open, meal periods is over. Third is what's available for you to do if you're in the market. Like if you're wanting to go to the museum, you have to make a reservation perhaps or something, that kind of information. And then the fourth is if you're in the market, what is it you might want to do other than what is available? What might you want to do? And that's where this conversation came out of was, okay, I'm, I'm there for whatever reasons I have to travel for or desire to travel, what do I want to do? And there's like these great driving around things or, you know, see this or see, and not necessarily having to get out of the car or if you do, it's a low density, good distance, masks included, whatever it is, it just started creating this list of stuff. And that interesting article was you know, about, hey, some people want to go see where certain shows were made. I mean, my wife is still a huge fan of Bloodline, which is we live down in the Florida Keys, and she wants to go down and see all the places they did the video shooting, even though we live there, we know where they were. She wants to go see them again. You know, okay, so we'll go drive and drive and see what it looks like, you know. But those are all different little reasons why people might want to stay with you. Yep. Yeah, one, one of the biggest untapped resources in ho hotel marketing is your consumer database. Now, you have... The e or you should have the email address from almost everyone that's ever stayed with you in the last, say, 10 years, right? You should have that. If you if you don't, you should be working towards that. But they, they are willing, especially right now, to offer their opinions on things. And one of the easiest questions to ask them, if you want to go that route, is what are the things you do while you're in town? And you can have a list, but you can also have an open-ended question and let them fill it in as well. And then you can find out, okay, these are the things that drive people to our destination. These are the things that I need to be talking about in my marketing to drive more people to, the, to this hotel. It's real easy. I don't understand why people don't talk to their guests more about what they think and feel and hear and their, their rationale for why they chose your property. It's a wealth of information that you can leverage. You have to opt in, you know, all the time and double whatever and you got to be within six months and I don't know there's like too many wrong <laughs> no that's know? I mean that that's the excuse people give but it I mean oh. the reality is if you if you do it properly and you provide value with 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 the engagements that you're creating with the guest it, it's not it's not tough I mean double opt-in isn't something that's required it, it's something that's recommended but mm -hmm. um you know as long as long as you're respecting privacy and not selling data and not sharing data and you're you know, sending people what you say you're going to send them when they opt in. I mean, it, it's not that tough. Strangely enough, I've been well, we want to been. give you responses. Huh? Uh, we've been trying to convert more and more people to my SMS messaging via using more of the messenger botting. 
offering them incentives. Yeah, SMS is very effective, but but it's going to get it's going to get overused. In in we're going to marketers are going to ruin SMS like they did email. Well, they were we were in everything because we over you know to your point we abuse it over time. Uh, but the neat part of it is is that we're getting we we've had our first big successes with it just recently where we first we, we accumulated enough audience. And then we started offering, after we gave them the incentive to sign up, we gave them an incentive to use it. And we got some good wins with it. And we're like, wow, this is awesome. And the first thing we did, credit to you, Stuart, it's like, stop, let's not burn this. Let's, we did what we did, we got what we got, pause. Let's mm -hmm. give it some time. Nobody's wanting to do the next best deal. Let's just mm -hmm. chill right now. And then when the next opportunity comes up, We'll offer something else with it, but it was very productive. I mean, for our first effort for it, it did really, really well, and it wasn't a big audience. We only had just high of three hundred people that had signed up over the course of the past forty-five, sixty days, uh, mm -hmm. which we, we were pretty proud of. And then uh, we went over and sold some pretty decent chunks of business through it just by offering them a last minute. Like, this is what we're doing for certain pivotal times in the future. We did the, uh, what we're talking about. Hey, it's going to still be, well, this is Canada. You know, it was Boxer Day and so forth and so on. Make your plans now. Did you say Boxer Day? You mean yeah. Boxing Day? Boxing, Box Day, Boxing Day. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that. <laughs> that's, that, that's like your Independent Day, isn't it, that you have? <laughs> we, we, we forgoed that one. We didn't have that this year. We had a okay. uh, sit at home and do your fireworks day. <laughs> And it traumatize your pet's day. Yeah, traumatize your pet's day. Yeah, no. <laughs> but uh, just stuff that we just offered them to, that this is the chance we're having the best deal we have now, and we'll guarantee the rate anyway. Even if we do end up lowering it, you'll still get the better rate. And people decided this was worth buying at this time. So, um, unless, unless, sorry, unless Boxer Day is the day that you leave your underwear at the hotel. And that's what I was That's brief day. That's, that's, that's brief, day. brief day. Okay, got or, as we like to call it, tidy whities. <laughs> tidy whities. <laughs> Oh, come on, Lauren. What are you doing? Don't get an image. Don't get an image. Don't get an image. <laughs> Before you joined, Stuart, he was talking about top knots. Yeah. I'm not top knots in the 90s now. Lauren, in the <laughs> oh, see, now it's in my head. I can't unsee that now. No. That's it. Top what do you man think is the ideal number of emails a hotel can send without being annoying? As many as they possibly can. No, I don't know. <laughs> what time period, Adele? For what time period? Yeah. Like once, once a month, three times a month. What do you talk? What do you? So what do you I, think? So, so one one of my teachers offended me the, the the most ever in college because he always corrected my questions and and what he would always say and it would piss me off. But now I started doing it to other people. And I'm going to do it to you. So I don't mean to piss you off. I mean That's this okay. sincerely. When I say you're asking the wrong question, okay. because it's really not about the number of emails. It's about the value that the email represents to the guest in, in whether or not it's something they want to receive. And, and the reason I say that is if you look at the guest journey, right? So if the guest is someone that's shopping for a hotel, then the frequency that you hit them matters because if I'm hitting them every 20 minutes or every day, it's going to get overwhelming and annoying, right? But once they've booked and they're waiting for their stay, I I have permission at that point, inferred in in you know in in terms of the social contract between them to send more frequently if I'm providing value. But if if I if say they're they're coming in two weeks time and I send them five emails in that two week period, but every single one of them gives them valuable information that is going to improve their experience, they're going to say I love every one of those emails and send me more of that stuff. But if I only send them three and every one of them is just trying to hit them on the head with upsells and cross sells and it's self-centered for me as a property, they're going to say, don't send me that much, right? So it's not about how many you send. Yeah. It's about the quality of the content that you send. And it, is it something you're sending that benefits the guest instead of benefiting the hotel? I mean, it can benefit the hotel, but as a byproduct of benefiting the guest. There's and also a kind of issue. Sorry, right. sorry, Lily. Are you, are you going to say the same? I was going to say that there's, there's a timing issue. Essentially, with it. partly yeah. that. And also, you know, there's a, a resort that I was working with. And so I was automatically on their email distribution after having made some test reservations. And uh, so I asked them because I would hear from them maybe every two or three weeks, right? Which mm -hmm. is fine. But 
every time I would get two or three emails within 30 minutes that were different. And so I asked them about it. I was like, you know, what's going on? It looks like these campaigns are maybe being pushed out more than once at a time. And they said, oh, no, no, we have different target lists. So there is, you know, our leisure guest list and our meeting planner list and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, but I'm on all three and you're pushing them all out simultaneously. Maybe I could be targeted with more than one, but they shouldn't all then go out on the same yeah. day. If you're already going every two or three weeks, maybe have one leisure focus this week and one meeting focus the next week, because otherwise I'm like, I just feel like there's an error and I'm getting spammed. Yeah. That's just lazy and bad, mm-hmm. bad marketing and bad marketers ruin it for the rest of us. For sure. Yeah, and I think similarly to the to the point that Lily was mentioning there about the timing as well. It all depends on what the uh, uh, what the the intent of the email is, as Stuart was saying here. If it's an informative email, yeah, great. You know, that's fine. You know, that you, you can probably get away with that a little bit more often um, in terms of frequency. In terms of timing of when you send it, that is just as important as it as is the frequency of the um, of the email being sent. Cart abandonment, for example. You know, if you get through to the booking engine and you put in um, uh, your email address, but then you don't actually make a, a booking. We know that there's the, the, there's a level of intent. And even with GDPR, you know, you can use that email because there is um, a legitimate interest and you've uh, you, there's somebody shown a, a, a genuine interest and you've got the, the almost to the perfect point of booking, but stop. So you've got intent. If you hit somebody with an email, sorry, hit somebody. If you if you send an email out to somebody there, giving them a you know a, 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 an additional value, why they should come back, whether it's a discount, whether it's a valued ad, whatever it may be, they may have got to that point because they're you know the booking engine may be you know um, uh, not terribly optimized, shall we say, and you're and you're only giving them a price right at the very end. So I'm going through all of that because I'm trying to find a price for your hotel versus the price of three others in the area. Now, if you if you get an email, a cart abandonment email sent to them within 24 hours, or you know you test the times, it could be within an hour, it could be within 24 hours, it could be within 48, whatever it may be. But if you actually send that email out with the valued ad, you're then targeting that person who's kind of sat on the fence and still making their decision about which in the comp set am I going to stay in? And that's their comp set, I suppose, you know, maybe not necessarily yours. You give them that extra value to come. This is still simple remarketing 101. The chances are they're gonna they're gonna book via that email and they're gonna come back because you, you you're giving them that extra incentive to come back. That's why you know Ben and I, uh, Lauren, anyone else who does this, you know, even Stuart at Fuel and, and your team. That's why remarketing works. But it's all about the timing of that message. But if you then keep hitting them with constant messages for the next three weeks after it, well, chances are they've probably booked, and all you're doing is annoying somebody and probably not legitimate interest anymore. You shouldn't really be hitting that person um, as many times. So it's, it, it's about timing and frequency. Yeah, and one of the things we always look at is, is this is a relationship, right, between you as the business and, and the guest. And every interaction you have with them in, in person and digitally has an opportunity to improve that relationship and tighten it or to weaken the relationship. Yeah. And so every email you send, you need to think, what is this doing to the relationship? Just like if they were standing at my front desk, how would I talk to them? What would be appropriate to talk to them about right now? You know, if they're standing here and I start preaching to them about buying a timeshare while I'm in front of me and it's going to negatively impact their relationship, then I probably shouldn't be doing that and selling something else to them on email. So think of it as a a one-to-one relationship. I think a lot of people look at a database of email addresses and say, I've got 10,000 emails and let me figure out, okay, if I can get a 20% open rate and a 4% click through rate, and this is going to make me this much money. Well, that 10,000 people were were all individual human beings and and you're having an impact on every single one of them with every message you send. So you need to be really thoughtful and mindful about what you send, why you're sending it. And to Lily's point, you know, if someone is on multiple segments within your, your database, Think that through. Think about the fringe cases. What what does this look like for someone that's just on one segment versus on three segments? And one of the things we really found is is lifted engagement rate tremendously. Talking about timing, is ab ab we we partnered to produce a CRM platform with a company called Blue Shift. And one of the the things it does is it optimizes the delivery time for each individual based on their history. So if 
I've sent out to 10,000 people five times, it starts to pick up patterns of when Chris opens his email or, or reads the email versus Ben does. And then it's going to del- stagger the delivery. So not everyone gets it at the same time. It's going to mm-hmm. stagger it. So Tris gets the email maybe an hour before he typically looks at his email. So it's near floating to the top of his inbox at the time that he typically checks his email. So timing is important. Frequency is important. But the most important thing is the content and the value. Uh, yeah. I, I've, I've yet to figure out a perfect build yet, and I've been trying to do it all my entire time. And one of the reasons the evil plan we have for the SMS messaging is – staging that that broadcasting that people tend to do with with emails like here's my newsletter go figure out what's interesting instead Mm -hmm. we're trying to offer content on our social platforms by soliciting people to join our social platform and when we geo target our paid campaigns or demographically target the people that we think the offer is more valid for and then we offer the conversion value through the email directed just to those people because we're segmenting out who we're sending these emails to based on that same criteria. So we're talking about an event or we're talking about a reason to travel with us. And then we go to an offer via the email that is an incentive to maybe augment what they saw as, as content. And the next stage that we're trying to get to is beyond the workflow of the email, like did they open it, not open it? Did they retrigger or resend? How many days after that's on its own is the SMS of the extra enhanced value that you're willing for us to actually communicate on another channel that says, you saw our content, you saw our email offer, but you are so special. We're sending something uniquely to you on this one platform. We're trying to get to that point. I still haven't been, you know, hey, I mean, Mark, just, Mark, just give waiting. me a call after this. I got you covered, buddy. Thank we, you, we got that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's what we want to try to do. That's where we're trying to get to is that that's the, the evolution of the conversation. There's some really yeah. good platforms out there that are, that are doing that right now. I know, I know what you're talking about there, there Stuart, because Ben and I were, were we're talking with a company about exactly the same thing. And uh, what they're doing is they're not looking at SMS and email as two separate things. It, yeah. It's, yeah, it's we don't combined. Know. Yeah, so it, it may well be, you know, using the same intelligence that Stuart's talking about there about when to send the email. It's also mm-hmm. what happens if you don't open the email or don't engage with it? Do we have another source that we can try and capture? It may mm-hmm. well be that the email may work for you, but it may not work mm-hmm. for somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the other level of optimization we're experimenting with and using AI to, to kind of figure that out is is the channel. And right now we've got email and SMS, but we're also rolling in push notifications through the app yeah. as well. That's that's kind of the next phase. Cool. But we've, we've got great. that cr- cracked, um, Lauren. So I'll, I'll show cool. you that and, after the show. Have you guys seen, though, in uh, this just came up recently in the last couple of days, in my Outlook app on my phone, it now pops up a little bar at the end that says, get caught up, play your emails, audio. <laughs> really? Where's my, why, my My first question is, why in the world are you still using Outlook, number one? <laughs> <laughs> I love Outlook. Yeah, me too. What do you like better? What do you like I, better? I'm, I'm with you on that one. Gmail. I'm Gmail. I'm Gmail, yeah. Gmail, Gmail drives me insane. It's I think it's kind of the Apple Microsoft oh. thing. You either like <laughs> Gmail or Outlook, and yeah, yeah. yeah back, in, back in my Windows days, after my PS, what, what was the fight? During PSD? the war, after after the after the Outlook file got too big, and and Outlook would crash, and there was no way to recover it other than truncating a bunch of emails for the third time. I. I war off of Outlook. Now we're going to touch I haven't again. had those problems in years. Virginia made a good point uh, in the chat. The mom don't want to speak just doing a great job of this. Yes, they are. They are looking at multi-level platform communications and so forth. And 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 here, just as a nutshell, going back to almost the nexus of the beginning of the conversation, this is the advanced dialogue you don't see in the chatter that's out there right now. Mm. And I'm not trying to tout our show, but I'm. Uh, this is not the awesome. dialogue you're hearing. But it's awesome. We're not touting yeah. the show, but it's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> Tell you know, your this, is, this is the nuance of not just sending emails. Like what people out there are saying, oh, you should send out emails to your database. That's the 101 stuff that's still floating out there in white noise. It's the, yeah, that's nice, but that's not what fixes now. This is, that's the genesis of all this conversation. This is, you do that and this and this and this, and these are the variations to it. That's the dialogue that needs to get infused in more dialogue out there. Hmm. I think hey, guys, I got to jump. We've got a wicked thunderstorm just came through and there's hail coming in through one of my windows. So I got to go investigate oh, that. Oh, okay. hey, sure, real quick, Fuel Travel, where they find you, all that stuff. FuelTravel.com. Yeah, if you want a, a kick-ass CRM mobile app, booking engine, that's the place to go, FuelTravel.com. Keyless entry. 
Keyless entry. Keyless entry. Don't forget. And how we really podcast. Contactless is, podcast. The, is the uh, is the buzzword that everyone's using and searching for. Contactless app. That's all we got. We got you covered. Fueltravel.com. And listen to the podcast. Lily's been on it. Oh, we're recording one with Tim Peter. He's not good enough to show up for this show anymore, but he is going to be on our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Stuart. Watch out for the hail. Get it. Yeah, see you guys. Bye. 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 Nice, Stuart. There is one more thing I wanted to quickly mention about the, the email side of things, um, and that is we seem to get it as, you know, we've got an email list. Here you go. And that list remains forever and a day. And we'll just keep adding more to it. Well, actually, you know, sometimes you need to, it's, it's a living, breathing thing. You, you have to cull it. You have to, you know, if they, if you're not getting any engagement from somebody and, you know, the, the, you've sent X amount of emails out there and, and that'll be different for different hotels, different uh, reasons why you send them out. And, it, and if you're just not getting any opens, you're not getting any engagement with it, don't send them another email. Because again, you're just, well, one, you're wasting, you're wasting an email and, we know on the volume, you, you pay by volume with, with these things. Uh, but, to, you know, you're just potentially annoying somebody, you know. They may well come back to your property. They may well come back and use your service, but they might not want to do it through our email. So get rid of them. And don't think of it as a static email list. That list will vary by the week, by the email that's been sent out, by the frequency and the amount of emails that have been sent out. I used to, I mean, I've, and, and I would also recommend to, uh, to add to that is that I, I call those zombie lists is that, I would try another channel to them to communicate with. I would try to do it as a retarget on Facebook. If they're not responding to the emails, would they respond via the another channel? And even then, I wouldn't throw them away. I put them on a shelf saying, why did I get that list? Was it because they stayed with me during a certain time of year? Well, obviously, if they're not listening to me for anything else, maybe I try it one more time that time of year next year and see if they want to come back to hearing me. If after that, I think I got them and I can't do anything more with them. I've tried every other channel. Maybe that's the time to retire them permanently at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can upload, upload those lists into uh, digital marketing platforms, you know, like Google. Mm-hmm. Yeah, look at like audiences, yeah. custom audiences, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. customer match and all sorts. You can, you, can, you can target people based on their email because Google um, and Facebook being the sneaky devils that they are, whenever you log into Google now, you use an email address to log in. And it doesn't, very rarely does it log you out. When Google, when you've got a Google search and it's showing you the results for whatever you've typed in there, it may not necessarily be targeting you based on the keyword that you've gone in because, you know, or, or what, uh, you know, because it, the, it, the, the search is right for you. It may well be that they're targeting you on a thousand and one demographics, including your email being on a list of someone who's actually wanting to get there because the message that I display to you can be different. And Ben was really good with this, with uh, something that's called remarketing lists for search ads. The oh, message, yeah. The message that you put out there can be different based on the circumstances that you know that that person's already been back to your website. And, and well, I don't want to steal your thunder. If you want to give it away, there you but go. If I had $1 to spend on search marketing, if I had a cent to spend on search marketing, it would be branded RLSAs. We talk about the message and how important the message is. We, we, two and a half, three years ago, got this right completely by accident. And we ended up getting 40, 50, 60. It was accident, dude. I wrote oh, no, it was very great minds thinking, buddy. Come on. Come on. Oh, yeah, got, no, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, uh, as part of uh, the just the wonder that we are. I'm thinking blind uh, pig in the turnip, but that's just me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we were not drunk in a bar like no. all ideas start. <laughs> we, we ended up getting like 30, 40, 50 to one on top of funnel keywords like hotels and NYC. Which you'll all know, are like they're mm. incredibly they're expensive to get, and they're at the top of the funnel here. What we ended up doing, and I can name the hotel because it's not an independent anymore. Um, it is. Timeshare Hilton Grand Vacations property, which is uh, not worst of it at all. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely place. Um, <laughs> five, five, two blocks down from um, two blocks down from Central Park, and what we did was. Uh, the messaging, the, the original vanilla SEM, if you will, was you know, five-star opisons, luxury, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, when you went to the website, you were added, but didn't convert, you were added to our remarketing audience. And as part of the RSA campaign, if you searched the name of the hotel, any of their comp sets, or went back to the top of funnel, you were presented with still interested in the Quinn. How about 25% off, 20% off, 15% off your stay? And it was like fish in a barrel because mm. the message spoke to that person. 
it, it, I imagine if I was, if I was, oh god, I don't know where hotels in NYC. Bam. Still, well, I guess I am sort of interested in it. I, I spent the time looking through the website, so I mm-hmm. still am, and I still need to go to New York City. And twenty five percent doesn't sound bad. And we ended up getting insane ROIs. It was, it was brilliant, and it was a genuine That's accident. Smart. That was smart. And I, uh, the, I, I say to everybody that listens, if you have a dollar. RLSA is for, for your own brand, and everyone's everyone's response is, well, why should, why should I be RLSA my own brand? I should have to protect my if you have somebody, if you have a $1 and somebody's been to your website and then gone back to Google and then typed in your brand name again, they're, they're invested in your website, they've had a look at your hotel, and they're still interested. God knows why they've not typed, just typed the URL into the browser, but they've searched again. This You are the last bastion against the OTAs. That is the very last chance you can get their grubby, sticky little hands off your hotel. <laughs> it's by personalized messaging on, led with audiences for people who are searching for your brand. Mm. That's what I do with two dollars, and I'll tell you another story. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty happy we didn't have to hit the uh, Amsterdam brothel hotel thing because with Ben and uh, Tris checkered history, we'd we'd probably hear more stories than we wanted to know about their adventures in Amsterdam. Uh, (laughs) I think what my colleague is trying to say uh, (laughs) is that Ben and Tris are well traveled and experienced many of what Europe has to offer. <laughs> Such as the fine delights of Amsterdam, including uh, not limited to the food. I, I do have to say, though, I'm a little surprised because my, my, so my wife is Dutch and my family, uh, her family lives over there, so we come visit. Uh, the whole thing in the article that said that they were stopping pe- tourists from taking pictures that's been in existence for a really long time. Because when I was over there, my brother in law quickly, and I'm around there like a tourist, you know, and he's like, no. The guys will come out and kick your ass, but if they see you taking pictures of the place, so I'm like, look at this, you know. <laughs> so yeah, that's been around for a while. <laughs> yeah, no more, no more of that. That's a solid no, Negatron. Yeah, yeah, but they're, they're going to revamp the neighborhood, I guess. But we'll see. But um, and the boop was pretty good too. So uh, thanks to Robert for his list. Uh, I think we covered a good portion of them about the dialogue and so forth. And thank you all for for the additional contents and comments and so forth. Um, as, as a possibility, because with Robert being as busy as he is and, and his ladies with the list, I was wondering whether we wanted to try to shift things up in, in the future. And I'll send this out in the email to everybody, whether we want to bring a topic of interest ourselves uh, that we want to bring to the conversation just as a, hey, you know what? All of us have one in the holster for this is what I want to talk about. You know, uh, not nothing against Robert's list. He does a wonderful list mm-hmm. and it's great information. I just don't often want to shoot just from the hip that we're looking at it within minutes of talking about it when there's sometimes some really good stuff in those that we don't, you know, go back and go, oh, I wish I had talked about that instead. Uh, so I'm wondering whether we just want to shift it up a little bit since we, you know, we, we have a good uh, uh, diversity of our, our co-hosts that we may just bring one ourselves and say, hey, this is something I want to make sure uh, I'd love to hit and take yeah. it, you know, one at a time. I thought that with the shameless plugs that we were already doing. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's a given, um, <laughs> but no, just the, just the topic stuff, because uh, we have an amazing diversity of co-hosts and uh, it's from all disciplines and aspects and everything else. And, and we're not out to one up each other, although, you know, when Stuart's on, we just got to go over and trounce them, you know, or add either. Or <laughs> <one>. <laughs> but, but uh, I don't know, just as a thought. We'll, I'll, I'll throw it around the emails in the next week or so to yeah. give you interested in, in just, you know, bring this. You guys, Ben and, 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 and Tristan, you guys are putting some really cool content into LinkedIn and posts and stuff. And I know there's some really cool articles you guys floated up there. Adele, you, you're coming up with some, I mean, just your insights are always keen. Lily, you're coming up with some great content with Think Up right now. I mean, yeah. I'm, it's like I'm clicking like on everything you're popping up there. And I'm, and I'm wondering <laughs> You read halfway through and you're like, yeah, this is good. I like this. <laughs> yeah, I find that I'm turning into a Lily fanboy. I really am a link to yeah, right? I am not stalking like, it. Like this. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, and then when she sends me over the podcast to do the editing, I listen to the podcast. I mean, it's literally my chance to listen to the podcast. So uh, putting kind of content everywhere and then on and on with everybody else. I mean, honestly, you know, Stuart and what Fuel Travel they put out and everything. So uh, it, we seem to have this nice self-generated content or at least referral to con- things that we find of value and interest. And, and like I said, Robert puts out some great stuff and we'll always feature Robert's stuff and we'll always make sure that everybody understands where to get it and everything. But to our own, you know, we can bring our own things to it as well. So I'll throw that in the email for it. So with that in mind, um, Miss Lily Mockerman, if you want to know more about you, Think Up Enterprise or TCRM Services, where is it they can find you? <laughs> 
first off, I just want to congratulate you for so many consecutive weeks of saying both names correctly. I got it right. It takes me only five years, so we're good. <laughs> Well, you can find us at tcrmservices.com for all things excellence in day-to-day -day revenue management. Or if you're not sure whether or not to bring your staff back and you just need a month-to-month -month solution, that's TCRM for you. Uh, thinkupenterprises.com, you can find all things consulting, help selecting the right technology, assessments to help you hit the next level in revenue and profitability and sales and marketing convergence. And of course, the podcast that Lauren is referring to is there as well. Ben, other than being totally impressed that you read books, which <laughs> I'm a Just revelation me. for me today. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but I could give you a podcast on books if you wanted to. It's the only thing that, I, it's the only thing that, that, that gets my children to leave me alone. If you don't get Minecraft out of my face, I'm going to tell you about War and Peace. Uh, if you don't get out of my damn face. Uh, so what's... three and six, you guys. Three and six what's... digital without this dishonesty. Uh, hospitality marketing agency behind the smoke and mirrors behind a curtain um, we have no need to uh, no need to try and bamboozle you or talk about you know 147 day attribution windows uh, if you've ever smelled an ad we won't take credit for that you know it's, it, it really is um, trying to pull back the curtain and be a little bit more open transparent and accountable with them. Uh, SEO SEM website meta search the whole nine yards and we're British now, are you well. focusing in the EU only? Are you global? US? What do you? What do you? You just fit? You know, everywhere and anything. Okay. Global baby. Global. Okay. Global baby. <laughs> global baby. Uh, yeah. 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 Got we're, some uh, some interesting. We've got, people, we've got people in in the USA. Um, yep. And, and we've got people in the UK uh, and a little bit and, further over. And all over in the Far East as well. We're expanding very rapidly. Uh, but, uh, taking on a couple of interesting clients this week, where we'll be able to Excellent. say a, a little bit more about that next week. Uh, trying not to smirk when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tris, anything to add to that other than, you know, you're dressed nicer, smell nicer, more groomed and have nicer headstones or, you know, anything like that? I, I think you said it all for me, but I, but to echo Lily's, Lily's thoughts, I'm just really impressed you know the difference between Ben and Tris. Is, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, honestly, in our previous company, the CEO thought we were one person called Benantris. <laughs> <laughs> which is Lovely fair. Guys. Which is fair because we were always referred to as Benantris. Benantris. <laughs> oh, oh my yeah. gosh. That is, that is good. <laughs> Adele, I know there's a lot going on, and it says that, you know, yeah. expire at rep 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 reputation and so forth. What's going on? After 20 years of putting the Library Hotel collection on the top of the list on TripAdvisor and winning the number one highest uh, guest, satisfa guest satisfaction ranked hotel in the world from Review Pro, I am now on a mission to help hotels around the world uh, expedite their recovery with a uh, reputation renovation. And I have a new website, AspireReputationMarketing.com. And you can even get a free assessment. Thanks, Lily, for the good idea. You can get a free assessment and uh, initial consultation to put you on a road to five-star reviews. That is awesome. I think your timing, I think mentioned beforehand, the green room is absolutely excellent. Sorry, Adele, can I ask, how many hotels did you have in the top 10 at one time? What was the, what was the most? Yeah. Well... Of the four hotels in New York, they are today, 2020, number one, number two, number three, and number 18. Ten years ago, they were number one, number two, number three, and number four. And they've pretty much all been in the top 10 for almost 15 years. Only in the past year did one slip out of the top 10 fair dues it's 511 hotels in new york so i think that's pretty awesome, and it's pretty awesome. yeah it's more than pretty awesome like that's yeah. a horn that we'll be too in that's winning the lottery every week <laughs> <laughs> the aria hotel in budapest was number one in budapest within three months of opening has stayed there for five years and was also named the number one hotel in the world on TripAdvisor. For 2017 out of 1.1 million accommodations uh the aria hotel prague which i helped launch uh spent 18 months going back and forth from 
Prague to put that on the list. It was the number one hotel on Prague right away and was named the number one hotel uh, in the number one luxury hotel in the world on the TripAdvisor Travel Assurance Awards a few years after opening. And even the hotel I stayed at when I was when I when the Aria was a construction site, that became number one hotel in the world. Too. <laughs> so uh, I kind of know something about this. Yeah. I'm not sure. a little fuzzy. I want to know might know a little bit about you know culture and quality of service. I just, yeah. I'm, I'm I, I, on I, I have to I'm say on one more. The Hotel X Toronto isn't even completely finished yet, and it's already number four in Toronto. So yay. Okay. See, I'm I don't want to connect the it. dots, Adele here, but you see it seems like everything you touch turns to gold. <laughs> <laughs> on number one, I think. Adele Midas Gutman. I like that. <laughs> Midas yeah. Marketing. New name. Yeah. 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 Midas. yeah. And, yeah. and as I said, it can happen in any classification of hotel. Uh, and uh, it, I, it actually thrills me, as I said, to see uh, juries take that, uh, that great spot in the J.D. Powers Awards. Yeah. So it's so satisfying to see that happen. It's brilliant to see you out doing this for other yep. people, Adele. Uh, yep, I'm, 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 wish you all the success and all the luck with it. And 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 I can I just say when we were managing the digital marketing for your uh, your hotels, um, our success that we got for you had nothing to do with us whatsoever. It was entirely down to you and TripAdvisor. So <laughs> thank you. Well, you definitely have. <laughs> so, it's like, do we need to market the best hotel in New York or the worst of the let's go with the best one? Yeah, yeah. let's go do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that should be easy to do. I mean, at least straight up front. But yeah, no, it, it's very true. And again, it goes back to showing the components of the. It's not changing landscape. It's more more pronounced now that it's not just the marketing, it's just not the revenue management, it's just not the operations. It's just it, it's it's the culture. It's it's all the things working together in that process, and that's what makes kind of the dialogues we have so much fun. It's because we're all approaching it from different angles of like, well, if you do this, this is great. But if, if everything else fails, that one thing doesn't succeed. So it's that accumulation of everything. And, and it is a real pleasure to have everybody being able to, to do that. So thank you all very much. For that. If for anyone wanted to play back all previous 258 episodes, including now the 259 of this, uh, plus also we do the podcast, which is we do a quick recap, plus tools and then techniques. Uh, and then of course, uh, Ben, ben are you guys going to do a podcast someday? I mean, you're kind of out of the club here. What's up? No, we, we will be, but... Uh... We're, we're unfortunately we're being too successful at the moment. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, and, and, no, 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 no. I'll have my secretary, Lauren, call your secretary, and we'll get all this. My people, down. your people. Oh, hey, I'll, I'll take a private jet. And we'll fly over together. I will. I will. Middle seat's empty, of course. Um, Can I just say, Ben, I'm not calling Lauren again. I am not your secretary. All right. <laughs> I mean, you're dressed a bit like one, so that's fine. Well, you know, but uh, his high voice doesn't really sound like the girl you think he does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my. Lauren, where can people get in touch with you? you? Hospitalitymarketing.com <laughs> forward slash live. That's where you get all the episodes. And hospitalitymarketing.com uh, forward slash podcast for the podcast. Um, yeah, that's the places for all the archives of the shows. And everything else is cool and fun and all the links we have for everything. And again, a tribute to Mr. Robert Cole for giving us a list. You can get this downloaded at uh, or sign up for it to get it every week at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Rock Cheetah, low, all over case. You can sign up and get the list of the uh, the links that you'll see in the show notes from that all as well. So with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, privilege of your time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a lot of fun for everybody else. Uh, Holly and everybody else has been uh, and Lex and everybody else and, and Tamara for your comments, Virginia for your comments, everyone else who participated. Um, not, kind of quiet on the other channels, which was okay. Apologize for LinkedIn. Again, I think our bit rate is throwing us off when we do the simulcast and it just doesn't do it on its own. So there will be a replay of LinkedIn uh, on LinkedIn, I should say, on Monday of the show. And I'll answer any emails that come out of that. And of course, we simulcast this on um, 1130 Wednesday, uh, Sydney time for the APAC group and 1130 AM London time as a repeat for the EU group, for those that may have missed the live broadcast today. So with that, thank you, everyone. And we'll see you all 1130 Eastern U.S. time next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.